I can see uh, almost all of your faces. So if you haven't got your webcam turned on, please turn it on so I can see your wonderful smiling faces. Uh, that's, that's great. Because I'd like to get to know the people that I'm working with. The, uh, so welcome to uh, Electronics. Welcome to ESIS 50. Um, you've all received the syllabus and in the syllabus gives you guidelines on several critical tasks that I've asked a number of you to do. And one of the first things that I've asked everybody to do in my emails and also in the syllabus is definitely get on to Khan Academy. And the directions for getting on to Khan Academy are, are spelled out in pretty good detail in the syllabus. Um, I will say this, during our breaks, and we will have 10 minute breaks, uh, 10 minutes to each hour. So at 6.50, we will have a 10 minute break. I need you to get up, I need you to walk around, I need you to stretch your legs, throw some water on your face. At 8.50, uh, 7.50, we will have a break. 8.50, we will have a, a break and we should finish at 9.50. So uh, th those are built in. And so during those break times is where I want to take um, special time with anybody who has individual questions that you'd like to, to put to me uh, for any questions pertaining to how to get into this system, how to utilize that, or things in general. We had a really nice welcome um, session on last Friday. Um, many of you attended that, and it uh, addressed a number of uh, questions and uh, answers that um, I hope the people who were not, oops, my speaker is not working, so let me check that. I apologize. Where am I? Hmm. Yeah, your voice is much more better now. Okay, I'll try it. I'll try it with this microphone and, and see how things work out. All right. So anyway, we had a really nice session on Friday, answered a lot of questions. If you missed that session, I sent out a follow-up email uh, for that, um, uh, for the YouTube link for that session. So uh, please do view it because it'll answer a lot of questions pertaining to the mechanics of what is Canvas, what is Zoom, how we will use Zoom, uh, how lab is conducted, things of that sort. Uh, before we get started, are there any general questions that anybody may have? I'm looking at here, I'll be using ATM. Have another kit of my own, no multimeter. Are we only meeting once a week? Yes, we have one class meeting once a week. Uh, it is on Tuesday evenings from six until 9.50. Uh, and then the, the session is recorded. And I encouraged everybody in our Friday night welcome meeting is if you got nominated next Tuesday to be the one family member that has to take grandma to the airport and you're gonna miss part of the session, well, don't take off for the whole evening. Come back for the balance of the session because we're here for a number of hours. Uh, but let's say you're gone for, for a good part of the session, or maybe you even miss a session. It is going to be recorded, but nothing beats the immediacy of seeing your classmates on the Zoom screen and being able to hear their questions and the responses by myself. And also some responses may come from your classmates as well. So I find that each semester I find uh, it is as much a learning experience for this instructor as it is for hopefully for my students. So the interchange that we enjoy during our class sessions together on Tuesday nights uh, is far better enjoyed live than viewed in a recording. But to answer your question, one class meeting per week. And the rest of the time uh, between this Tuesday and say the following Tuesday, you can always reach me through uh, my email, which is in um, our syllabus. And we also use another communication tool called Discord. And uh, so far we have about half of you signed up on Discord. I'm gonna get the other half of us signed up on Discord in just a moment. Discord is a really handy communication device where students can communicate with a question to the entire class. Uh, so, for example, co-assigned question number 14, and I got stuck on number 14. How do I reason out number 14? I don't just ask for a number and say, oh, yeah, it's 32. Help somebody understand how we got to 32. That's really the better question. That's a better learning experience. So that's how I would like for us to use 
Discord is uh, because Discord is available for you to use as an app on your phone. It's available in Android and it's also available in uh, iPhone. And what's really neat is that unlike Canvas and unlike Zoom, you don't have to go to a computer. Most of you carry some kind of a smartphone or are not far away from a smartphone. And so by having Discord in your hands, you can very easily reach out to the entire class or myself for some uh, very, very quick questions. Uh, let's go ahead first and foremost and get that Zoom, that uh, Discord screen on for you. I will type that into the chat. D-I-S-C-O-R-D dot com, discord.com. And if you haven't already signed on, uh, please do so. If you have already signed in, then we'll see your name. And I will go and share my Discord screen with you. So share, and it should be this one, and share. Ooh, yay. All right, can everybody see this? kind of a black looking screen and you see something in the middle called breadboard tutorial if you see it uh, if you don't see it let me know by shouting out now how do we get the rest of you on here is very simple I am going to invite people and the invite code is good for today only I'm going to copy this and I'm going to put it into our chat. Okay, so in the chat box, if you have not already signed on to Discord, please click that link, and that link will take you directly to Discord where you can create your, your account. And I ask you to do this, is when you create your username, please do so with your first name and your first initial. So, it would be Sam.H or Sam H or Tony P or Susie Q. So whatever the first name is plus your first initial of the last name would be great. That will help us identify who is who. And we will be able to see your identities pop up very, very shortly. Hold on, just I see a number of people coming on. Yay. Do you mind sending that link again? Uh, it's it's in the chat uh, of Zoom. I turned off the uh, share screen, so if you go to your uh, the bottom of the Zoom screen, you will see my mouse. The bottom of the Zoom screen, right about in the middle, you'll see this thing called chat. When you click on it, it'll open up a white um, window on the side of your screen, and at the bottom of that uh, that chat column will be the link that you simply click that will take you to the um, discord page nice all right so for discord let me start marking people off so i've got zaidi for discord andrew g for discord and while I'm doing this, let's go ahead and pause the recording. So we had an, interest, uh, an interesting question had come up during the week. I'd spoken with one of your classmates. And if you look at the middle of the screen, if you look at the middle of the screen, uh, everybody take a look at, um, you see co-guide lecture will begin at 6 p.m. Please stand by. And right underneath, Kogai, you see Luis A, you see Lime, and you see Carlos N. Everybody see Carlos N in, in uh, right above Andrew G in the in the um, uh, Discord screen. So Carlos, you did not type in the little saying in front of your name, did you? Yay, you made it. Dot and then Carlos dot N. You didn't type that in, did you? Maybe that's not a good example. Chandler, all right. So Chandler, let me ask you a quick question. Uh, you didn't type in behind your name, just showed up with an exclamation mark, right? I did not do that, no. Okay, so th th that's what I thought, is when, when people create an identity, 
uh, Discord automatically pops in these interesting little sayings on the uh, on the side, and because the, the student was looking, I didn't type that in. Where where that where that where, where did those words come from? And so I I thought maybe it was auto generated, and evidently, unless you type in something, uh, which will the text will appear in white. So for example, Luis A. Luis, uh, you had typed in viewed, and because you had typed it in, the text is white. And for Carlos. Uh, and also Chandler, you didn't type in the little blurb that's in front or behind your names, and that's why the text is kind of grayed out. So we're, we're learning some interesting things with respect to uh, uh, Discord. So, so what I recommend is this. We, we had some really helpful um, links that were presented to us during the course of our time together on Friday. And a number of your class, several of your classmates were very kind to share some wonderful links and they typed it into the chat box in Zoom. Here's the unfortunate thing about Zoom is although I can get a recording of our session in Zoom, unfortunately I don't have access to the chat information. So what happens to be in Discord that was saved, uh, because this was typed back on Friday, if you scroll up, and, and let, me, let me share my screen with you. Everybody can see my screen now, and could you mute your microphones, please? Everybody, please mute your microphone. Thank you very much. And as you're looking at my screen, and I'm scrolling up, past here, past here, past here, do you see underneath the little symbol for breadboard tutorial, there was a contribution by a classmate, Kirsten, and another cl contribution by a classmate, Javier. Everybody see those, those contributions? If you can see those contributions, raise your hands. And what those contributions are, are they happen to be a link to where you can acquire uh, a copy of the textbook. Now, as an instructor, I'm bound by copyright laws. I can't promote this. I can only point out that someone had put this up uh, for the benefit of all. And uh, Javier took it one step further and he made that uh, PDF package then available for classmates for his Dropbox account. So, that's all that I can say about this, but it sure looks like there's a free textbook out there that would be very helpful to you. Um, and it happens to be in Discord. So this is one of the benefits of how we can use Discord um, for any interesting links uh, that uh, we find that we can share with each other that would be uh, very helpful. And I see Mr. Frank Sepulveda, Francisco Sepulveda came on also. So let me get, any questions on Discord before I get off of this screen? So Mr. Sepulveda, before you leave. Can you uh, hear me? I can hear you just fine. I'm gonna, oh, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get that link. So copy this link, copy. I'm gonna stop the share, come back to our regular screen, and let's go here to everyone in the meeting and go here and paste. So Francisco, can you see the link at the bottom of the chat screen? Can you see the chat screen and the link at the bottom of the chat screen? Um. I just see like all the classmates. I don't know how to get there. Okay, all right. okay so here, here. Uh, on the bottom of the Zoom screen, you, <coughs> you'll see a command called chat. So if you move your mouse to the bottom of all your classmates' pictures in the middle of the Zoom screen at the bottom, you'll see an icon that says chat. When you click on that, it'll open up a window on the side of your screen and it'll have all kinds of information. Mm. Oh, um, let's see. Okay, I see it. Chat. Okay, and then there is a link. Yeah. Should okay. I click it? Yeah, and you click that, and it'll open up Discord. And Discord is uh, a wonderful communications device that we were just using a moment ago. 
Okay. And so while you're doing that, <laughs> remember, you're creating an account. I'm looking for your first name, dot first initial of your last name. If you put down as your identity, Honey Bunny 64, I have no idea who Honey Bunny 64 is. So that's why I'm yeah. asking for first name, dot last name, first initial of the last name, okay? So I'm okay. Gonna... <laughs> You can change your account name in the Discord server if you right click on your profile on the right side and it'll work for just the server. So you can change the name to yeah. the correct format. I can do that with nicknames on my side as well. So somebody put on Ninja Terrorists. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. So Andrew had put down PDF book, book looks great. Wish we had that a couple of weeks ago before he bought the hard copy. Well, sorry, we didn't know that these wonderful opportunities were available to us. But uh, I will say this, that um, I like, you know, real paper. I like real bound. I like real books because I like putting in post-its and, and, and stickums and, and write in the margins. And anyway, I'm a little old school, so I find it faster for me to, to flip through real pages. Okay, any other questions regarding Discord before we leave this? We just leave it in the background. We don't have to turn it off. Just leave it in the background. And as we continue with our discussion during the course of the evening, if any of you uh, type in something that is uh, contributory to um, helping our classmates learn better, do better, perform better, uh, anything that's contributory in that fashion, uh, there, there are bonus points that are available. How many of you like bonus? Bonus, free points. How can you earn bonus by helping classmates? Well, in the classroom, like we're going to have in the fall, I'll be back in the labs. We'll all be hands-on on, on uh, our equipment. And so side by side with your classmates in lab, you might see somebody who's got that expression, that blank expression, like a deer lost in the headlights. And you lean over and say, hi, can I help you with something? And when, I, when, when instructors see students helping each other, you know, we, we, we like to go and, and, and reward them with, uh, with a, a, a bonus something. And bonus points are a really nice way to do that. And uh, we've also had students nominate a classmate who uh, had helped them do something uh, in, in a challenging aspect of, of some, some uh, exercise. And they say, well, Co, you might not have noticed this, but so-and-so had gone out of his way or her way to help me with this particular exercise and I'd like to nominate him or her for some bonus points. And so uh, we, we really foster that type of uh, mindset and that type of of a community between all of us that are here. All right, fantastic. That will take care of that. All right, let's start with uh, some things here. Talk a little bit about, let's do a little lecture first. Let me give you my PowerPoint. So I will, I will post the PowerPoint. I'm still doing some fine tuning on it. And I'll post it into Canvas in a little bit. Um, but let's go ahead and talk about a few things. PowerPoint, it's here. Raise your hands if you can see my PowerPoint. Fantastic. All right. So, welcome to ESIS 50. And first slide that I'd like to introduce you to is this. All right. In the beginning, in the beginning, there was the atom the smallest component of matter that can't be separated any smaller without losing its physical properties. Are there things smaller than an atom? Yes, there are subatomic particles. So whose model of the atom are we using? Could everybody mute their microphones, please? If you can mute your microphones, it'll keep uh, some of the background noise, like shuffling of papers and, and uh, coffee cups and things like that from... Uh, 
bleeding into our discussion uh, and that'll create less background noise. So uh, Bohr's model of the atom. So Bohr's model of the atom uh, is, is structured very much the way that you remembered it back in middle school and high school. There's a center part of the atom. The center part of the atom is called the nucleus. Another name for the center part of the, the atom would be the core of the atom. And there happens to be something called subatomic particles. What do you think subatomic particles mean? Sub, that part of the word SUB means what? Underneath, below, like submarine, like subway, uh, means underneath. And so underneath the surface of the atom, we have very specific particles of interest to us. They happen to be protons, neutrons, and electrons. And it turns out that the protons are in, and the neutrons exist within the nucleus. They're bound uh, through subatomic forces. The neutrons have no charge, and the protons have a positive charge. The electrons have a negative charge. Now, the electrons don't exist in the nucleus. The electrons exist around the nucleus, and they exist in what are known as bands, shells, or orbits, or ele uh, uh, electron energy levels. So as we look at this, we can see uh, green and red for the neutrons and protons, and you see the little pluses for the protons, meaning they're positively charged. They exist in the nucleus. Around the nucleus happens to be these rings, and within the rings happen to be the electrons. Now, this is Bohr's model of the atom, and it served us very, very well for decades uh, to analyze what's happening. Now, there also are other subatomic particles, which we're not going to get into, quasars, neutrinos, things of that sort. We'll leave that to the physicists. Our interest is really electrons, and specifically, why electrons? Let's go to the next slide. Here is a, is a designation of the different layers shells or orbits. Remember, there's different names given to these rings by various authors. They basically say this. You have an energy level of one, two, three, and four. The, the energy level of these electrons closest to the nucleus, the K level, have the lowest energy level. L, being a little further away, has a higher energy level. M and N have even higher energy levels. And depending upon the type of element that we have, whether it's copper or whether it's iron or whether it's zinc or uranium, there's different amounts of electrons that go around the, the core. So the higher the atomic number, the higher the number of subatomic particles. What we're most interested in is in this next slide. Here is the valence shell. It is pronounced valence. With a, uh, with a long A instead of valence. Valence is what people have over their windows. This is valence, and the valence shell is described as being the outermost shell of the electron. What is unique about the valence shell for us in electronics is this. It is the one shell that can release an electron. It is the one shell that can accept an electron. So that comes from the valence shell. So to repeat, the valence shell is significant to us as electron technologists in that it is the outermost shell. It is the shell that can release electrons. It is the shell that can accept electrons. And as the outermost shell, it can have a maximum of eight electrons. It cannot have any more than eight but it can certainly have less than eight depending upon where it sits in the periodic table. Now, what is of interest to us about this valence shell is explained in the next slide. In this next slide, what is shown here is an electron that has been freed from the valence shell. The electron that leaves the valence shell of an atom is no longer bound to that atom it has now departed from the atom. And as it leaves the valence shell of the atom, it, is, it now becomes a free electron. 
Now, in order for an electron to be free, it takes energy. We have to bump it with some kind of energy in order for that electron to pop out. How does this occur? Well, we'll talk about this in a moment. So let's, re let's take a look here. It takes energy applied to an atom to free it from its valence band. Free electrons have the highest energy level of any electron. So the valence electrons have the highest energy level in the atom, but free electrons have the highest energy level of any electron, and they exist outside of the atom. How do we get it outside? It will be explained in a moment. The next part here is really important for us to understand, this part right here. Freeing an electron will leave a hole or an absence of an electron behind. And what's shown in this illustration very nicely is once that electron pops out, what left there is something we call a hole. And we'll use that word again and again and again in the next few slides. Uh, the, we simply define the hole as an absence of an electron. Okay. And then finally, the last point here in this slide is only one valence electron can be freed at any time. We can only lose one, okay? Cannot lose more than one. All right, now we'll go to the next slide. And in this slide, um, we have an electron that has been freed. So what do we say here at the top? It takes energy in order to free the electron. We got to hit it with something. So we write down here, electrons, free electrons, valence electrons can be freed by the application of energy to boost the energy level of that valence electron via... And there's seven diff different methods that are identified. One is heat, and then electricity, and then applying a magnetic field, and then light, and then friction, and then chemical, and pressure. So these are the seven that you want to make note of. These, this is energy. Heat is a form of energy. Electricity is an energy. Magnetic field is energy. Light is certainly an energy. That's how solar panels work. Friction is a form of energy. Uh, chemical and pressure. And the best example I can give you for friction, freeing electrons, is this. How many of you remember as children, or how many of you have played with younger cousins, uh, sisters, or brothers uh, at, at a party with, with uh, latex balloons? And you get that latex balloon and you rub it on, the, on your sweater and it creates you with friction. You're, you're generating friction. You take that latex balloon and you stick it on the wall. And does it stay to the wall? Yeah, it does. Or another thing, you can take the latex balloon and rub it on your, your sweater or your arm. And then you put it next to somebody's hair and all of a sudden their hair goes in all different directions as it's attracted by the uh, free electrons that are around that balloon. So that is an example of generating free electrons by friction. Heat is, is another way of generating free electrons. Uh, if we measure free electrons in this piece of wire, okay, so here, here's an extension cord, and in this extension cord happens to be copper. It's covered with an insulator, but it happens to be copper. And the copper that's in this extension cord has free electrons simply because this is sitting at room temperature, which mm, this room is probably around 69, 70 degrees. If I take the same copper wire and I put it in the hot sun where it's really, really hot, the heat from the sun will free electrons in the cop from the copper atoms as well. So free electrons are the beginning of what is necessary for us to understand this phenomenon called electricity. So we need free electrons. What happens next is here. Uh, hold on just one moment. I've got my lab tech calling. Mr. Nabil, hi, our lecture has begun. Did you have a quick question for us? You wanted to say hi to the, to the students? Oh, hello. That was... Uh, it, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I guess we can just do it tomorrow. I was just setting up the labs for tomorrow. Okay, uh, I'll text you later during the break because somebody is going to remind me at 10 minutes to 7 that we have, I promise them, 10 minute breaks on the hour. Okay? Okay, I'll chat in a little bit. Thanks. Bye. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank Bye. you. That was our lab technician, Mr. Nabil Al Hamal. He's an ace lab technician. You'll love working with him when you meet up with him in the fall. He's fantastic, supports our students to no end. 
the slide that I have in front of us now that you all should be looking at, free electrons are free to roam around from atom to atom. So you see these atoms, and between these atoms happens to be a couple of free electrons. They're not attached to any particular atom. They have been freed from the valence shell, and they're floating around simply because of room temperature. Now, free electrons can exist in one of two forms. They can exist in the form of something called static electricity, or they can exist in the form of current. The difference between static electricity and current. How many of you who do your own laundry, if mama does your laundry for you, I can't help you. But if you do your own laundry or you go to the laundromat and you take your clothes out of the dryer, if you didn't throw in that anti-static sheet or that softener sheet, what happens when you pull your socks apart, your, your, your gym socks? You pull your socks apart and have you heard the snap, crackle, and pop of static electricity when you've taken clothes out of the dryer and separated them? That's static electricity. That is, those are free electrons that have no particular motion. That's called random motion static electricity. <clears throat> Pretty useless for us. And not only is it useless, it's actually detrimental in an electronics lab because uh, a number of circuit components that we're going to work with, we're going to be working with microchips and static electricity can destroy your microchips in an instant if you're not careful. Okay, So we don't like static electricity and we'll talk about ways of protecting ourselves. Now, what is the other form of electricity? Something called current. When we talk about current, what do you think about? You think about like river, water flowing in a river. You're thinking about some kind of flow. And that's exactly what current is. Current is the flow of electricity. And let's take a look at the next thought. Here is the next slide called the law of electrostatics. And the law of electrostatics say this. When you have light charges, they will repel each other. So if I happen to have positive and positive, they will repel each other. If I have negative and negative, they will repel each other. But if you take a look at the bottom of the slide, opposite charges do what? They want to attract, okay? Opposite charges will attract. So if I have a positive and a negative, boom, they're gonna come together, all right? So this is called the law of electrostatics. Now let's see how that applies with respect to current. In this particular illustration, we're going to talk about conventional current and electron current. Now, some of these topics are, are explained in, in, in greater detail in Khan Academy exercises, so I'm only going through the highlights of what many of you have already gone through or what some of you are about to go through on your Khan Academy exercises. If you take a look at conventional current, and what did I write down here? Conventional current, AKA. AKA means what? Also known as. So conventional current, AKA, also known as whole current, flows from the positive side of a VS. VS stands for voltage source. Ooh, I just messed up something, sorry. Okay, the positive side of a voltage source through a circuit to the negative side of that voltage source. Let's follow the picture. Conventional current is shown in red. And here's a battery, and the positive is on the post. And the red arrow shows the uh, conventional current leaving the positive, going through the wire across the top to the right, down through this component, which could be a lamp, a resistor, something. What's drawn is a resistor. Uh, it could be representative of a lamp because it's got this glowing action to it. And the red arrows go down and then go at the bottom to the right and they go back to the negative side of the battery. So conventional current flows from the positive side of the source through a circuit and ends up at the negative side of the source. Whereas electron current in the description flows from the negative side of a voltage source through a circuit to the positive side of that source. So take a look at the blue arrows. The blue arrows go to show electrons leaving the negative side of the source going down to the right, going up through your component, going to the right across the top and into the positive terminal. And so these two 
the current models are identical in terms of magnitude, identical in terms of amount, identical in terms of quantity, uh, the, the flow. They happen to be two different directions. And why do we have two? Well, in this initial semester, these eight weeks with us, we will focus primarily on electron current flow. In more advanced electronic circuit uh, semesters coming up, certain circuit analyses are far easier understood using conventional current, okay? So I just want to introduce that there's two different models. The literature talks about conventional current, otherwise known as whole current versus electron current. And this goes to show what's going on there. Now, let's take a look at our next slide. AC versus DC. AC stands for alternating current. DC stands for direct current. DC is represented by your nine volt battery. Your batteries are, are DC, your car battery is DC, that's direct current. Direct current, as the description shows here, current that flows only in one direction. And if we take a look at this illustration on the right, and you see the red arrow pointing to the right across the top, going down through the resistor, R stands for resistor. I'll talk about what that is in a moment. And the arrow at the bottom points to the left. Which model of current flow is being shown to us here? Is this electron current flow or is this conventional current flow? Somebody unmute your microphone. What do you think? Conventional. And it would be conventional. Why? Because it assumes a direction of possible. Yes, exactly from the previous slide, you are, all of you are correct. It's conventional because it flows from the positive side of the voltage source through the circuit to the negative side of the source. So you will very often see illustrations during these eight weeks together where the arrows are pointing, showing conventional current. It's okay. I said most of our emphasis this, these eight weeks will be on electron current, but from time to time you'll see this and you need to recognize, oh, they didn't draw the arrows wrong, They're, they must be talking about conventional current. So this serves several purposes in, 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 uh, um, for, for us to see it in the slide. Alternating current is something else, very interesting. If you take a look at the difference of this, of what is shown as the sources, on the left hand side, on the right hand side, back to direct current, how is a direct current vol voltage source drawn. It is drawn as long plate, short plate, long plate, short plate. Those are the words that I use. I could have said long line, short line, long line, short line, but we use the word plate because plates are what's physically inside your car battery. In your car battery, you have alternating plate. You have, you have long plate, short plate, long plate, short plate, long plate, short plate, long. Many, many plates in your car battery filled in an acid lead solution, and that's what generate electricity. So uh, as the early batteries were designed in this fashion, the, the symbol that is used in the drawing is drawn this way. And if you look at this carefully, long plate is shown with what polarity? Positive. And the short plate is shown with what polarity? Negative. Always remember, it is positive to be long, it is negative to be short. Remember that, okay? Everybody got that? Positive to be long, negative to be short. Now take a look on the other side. The other side, the source is not shown with plates. The, sh the source is shown with a circle with a little wave symbol through it. And that indicates that this is an AC voltage source, an alternating current source. And what it says here, the current reverses direction in equal intervals of time. So half of the time it's positive, half of the time it's negative, depending upon where we make the measurement. So Take a look at the far left illustration. It's marked as positive polarity because it is positive on top, negative on the bottom. And here, the author of this diagram is using conventional current. The current is leaving the positive side. And here, let me ask this question. Is conventional current, you see my mouse? Is conventional current in the left, far left-hand drawing 
is conventional current flowing clockwise or counterclockwise? CW or CCW? Which way is conventional current flowing in this diagram? Somebody? Clockwise. Your microphone. Clockwise. This would be described as clockwise, yes. Whereas half of the other half of the time, take a look at the middle diagram. The middle diagram says negative polarity only because we have negative on top. But take a look at the arrows. The arrow shows clearly, again, conventional current flow. And if the conventional current leaves the positive side, it must flow in this direction. So somebody describe what is the direction of current, conventional current flow in the middle diagram? Counterclockwise. Counterclockwise, otherwise abbreviated as CCW, okay? So very important things to note. Let me so move on. For, the, for alternating current on the positive polarity and the negative polarity, are those happening at the same time? They are happening every half a moment. One half of the moment, it is positive, and the next half of the moment, it is negative. And I'll show you more clearly in the next slide right here. If you take a look at this slide, this will help answer your question. It's a very good question. Uh, the lower diagram shows an AC source, and it shows uh, VAC. So V stands for voltage, AC stands for alternating current. And you can see that the symbol is a circle with a little wave through it. It's called the sine wave. And it shows arrows leaving the top, and it shows arrows leaving the bottom. So that means part of the time the current is flowing from the top of the source, part of the time the current's flowing from the bottom of the source. If you take a look at the waveform on the right-hand side of the slide, it shows initially the waveform is swinging positive above the zero line. Uh, like a roller coaster, and then it hits a zero, and then from the zero line, then it goes to the negative side of the waveform, like a roller coaster, until, and it comes back up until it hits zero. So half of the time it is positive, half of the time this is negative, and as it makes one complete cycle, one complete cycle is one positive and one negative. This positive and this negative comprise one cycle, one complete rotation of the waveform. That cycle ends right here. And then this starts another half cycle here. So what's shown in this picture is one and a half cycles. It interestingly, you might, some of you know this already, is that the AC plugs that are in your home, that you plug your wall warts in for your, your cell phones and such, Somebody please mute your mic, please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, if you happen to hear something happening in the background that you've tuned your ear out to, the rest of us can hear. Uh, uh, if you have a question, by all means, raise your hands or unmute your microphone. As soon as you speak, I can hear you. I can see you. And I, uh, you know, if you if you have questions, by all means, do ask. <clears throat> so. Some of you may already know this, that the uh, wall receptacles are rated at 120 volts RMS at 60 cycles per second. That means if we were to measure with oscilloscope probes to your wall outlet, we would be able to see on the oscope screen a waveform that goes positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, 60 times per second. In some countries, it's 50 cycles per second. So the these are the two frequencies that we will find for AC power throughout the world. Six, 50 cycles in some countries or 60 cycles in other countries. Who's right, who's wrong? There's no right, there's no wrong. It just depends on how the electrical system is set up. Okay, uh, did that answer your question, Chisumaga? Okay, and then if we take a look at the illustration at the top of this slide, at the top of this slide, take a look at our character Characteristic drawing for a DC voltage source. A DC voltage source is, as I've said, long plate, short plate, long plate, short plate. Does it matter which plate we draw on top? Could I have the could I have the short plate on top? Is that possible? Sure, it is. I can have that negative plate on top. I can have the positive plate on top. It just turns out that many authors 
draw it this way and they have the negative the negative plate on the bottom, positive plate on top. But it isn't always shown this way. But what will always be true is this. I have a 10 volt source. I have a resistor that's rated at two ohms. And if I calculate my current using Ohm's law, Ohm's law says V divided by R is gonna give me my current I, and my I is gonna be 10 divided by two, which is five amps of current. If I go to measure that, I will have a steady solid line that goes like this. It will not wave, it will be a steady, and it will be steady at five amps based on the parameters of this circuit. And if this were a measurement of voltage, it would be a rock solid 10 volts. It would be a straight line. Uh, this would be a waveform that shows current. I can also have a waveform that shows voltage. So this is how we would compare the, uh, the, the what we call schematic, the circuit symbols for a DC voltage source and an AC voltage source and how they compare with respect to direction of current arrows and how they compare when we look at them on a scope. And the next slide, this brings up some really important words that you all need to know. Electronic terms, starting tonight, we have concept, we have concept symbol, we have unit, we have unit symbol, and brief definition. So the first concept we're going to talk about is this thing called voltage. What do you know about voltage? Mama said, don't touch it. <laughs> don't put your fingers in the, in the power socket. So at least you learn that much from mom and pop. Why? Because of a couple of things. So the concept called voltage is represented by a symbol. That symbol is a capital V. A lowercase v means AC voltage. Capital V is typically what's used for DC or just generally for all voltage. What is the units of voltage? Voltage is measured in units of volts. So when you are asked how much voltage is in the wall, you typically say PG&E says it's 120 volts with an S at the end. And the symbol for the unit is also a capital V. How do we define voltage? Voltage is, oh, you guys let me go on. I promised you a break. I apologize. Somebody's got to remember to put me on a timer. Um, let's go ahead and I will time us out for a, a quick 10. And I will use this quick 10 for uh, bookkeeping and also answering questions for us. I will leave this slide up and let's go ahead and come back in 10 minutes, start. So we'll be back at uh, 7, 10, roughly, okay? So splash some water on your face, get some uh, fresh air. I'm gonna take care of my throat. Uh, Mr. Yes, please, go right ahead. Um, I was gonna say your your mic is like, sometimes it gets very staticky and other times it's it's fine. Um, just a yeah, small I comment. I was going to comment on the same thing on that. Yeah, it's it's really cracking in and out. And it just sounds like a lot of static. I apologize. Let's see what we might be able to do about that. If I change the microphone, let me stop the share for a moment so I can see which microphone I'm hooked up to. I've got a choice of several. Uh, cool. All right. So back to these electronic terms. Voltage. How do we define voltage? Well, you know not to touch the thing in the wall. Why? Because one of the definitions of voltage is this. It's described as the pressure to move electricity. It takes pressure to move something, okay? So pressure to move electricity, the force behind the electricity, the, the, the pressure the, to, to make the electricity flow, that would be one definition of voltage. Another definition of voltage, I put this down as number two, is the difference of charge between two points. When we go to measure voltage, we'll do the measurements with a digital multimeter. And if I use a digital multimeter, the digital multimeter has two probes, 
It'll have a red probe and it'll have a black probe. And what am I going to do with these probes is I'm going to measure between two points. And so voltage is always measured between two points. If you think of that, that, that battery that we had uh, in the previous illustration, this battery right here, didn't we have a terminal at the top of the battery? And don't we have a terminal at the bottom of the battery? And when you go to measure your flashlight batteries, for those of you who use flashlights, um, do, don't we measure them between the, this terminal at the top and this terminal at the bottom? So voltage is always measured between how many points, my friends? Two, always two points. Finally, another definition for voltage is given as EMF. EMF in this case is not electromagnetic field. EMF in this particular case stands for electromotive force. Okay? And it is as it describes electro, meaning electricity, motive, meaning motion, moving, force force to move the electricity, EMF. Okay, so these are three very appropriate definitions for voltage. The next electronic term that we need to introduce to is this one called current. And when we talk about current, as I said earlier, a number of you were thinking about water flowing in a stream. Well, what is the symbol that is used for the concept? The concept symbol is capital I. How do we measure current? What are the units? The units are amperes or amps. Everywhere throughout the world, it is amperes. And the reason why it's amperes is because it's named after Andre Marie Ampere, French scientist. And everywhere in the world, it's amperes. But we Americans, us Americans, like to abbreviate everything. So we Americans like to say amps. And so, it stays. We simply call this amps. And what, the, what letter is this? It's, uh, the symbol is shown as a capital A. So when you look at a fuse, your car fuse, this is the most common place for some of us to look at a fuse, or your circuit breaker at your home, or fuse box in grandma's house, the circuit breakers are rated in terms of amps. How much current will that circuit breaker hold? And it'll say 20A or 15A, 10A. And the same thing with your car fuses. 10A, 5A, 15A, 20A for amps. What, how do we define? What is the brief definition of current? The definition is the rate of flow of electricity. The rate of flow. How many amps are flowing at any given point in time? The next term that we want to be familiar with is this thing called resistance. And resistance, as the name implies, the definition is really good opposition to current as you look at this. The symbol for resistance is a capital R. The unit for resistance is ohms. And the symbol looks like this horseshoe symbol. It's a Greek letter. It's a Greek letter that is called omega. And it is the symbol that represents ohms. Ohms is the unit. R is the symbol for resistance. And the last one of this group for now will be power. Power is given with the symbol capital P, measured in units of watts, given by the capital W. And how do we define power? Power would be defined as energy either consumed or dissipated in the form of heat and or light. So take your light bulb, for example. Um, if you compare a 20 watt light bulb to a 100 watt light bulb and the 20 watt light bulb is lit and the 100 watt light bulb is lit, which one would you, and, and they both burn out all of a sudden and you want to go change them. If, if you go to change the 20 watt light bulb, as soon as it burned out, it would be warm to the touch. It might even be mildly hot. If you tried to touch the 100 watt lamp right immediately after it burned out, it would probably burn your fingers badly because that 100 watts compared to 20 watts is much higher amount of dissipation of energy in the form of heat and or light. So it is defined as the energy consumed, which is what's sucked in through your electrical system, 
and or dissipated in the form of heat or light. That would be defined as power. There's an interesting relationship between all of this that's this, that you, many of you encountered in, Ohm, uh, in Khan Academy, and that's called Ohm's Law. And this, this cartoon really does a good job of showing us uh, these three quantities. If you take a look at volt, volt is the pressure that's trying to move the electricity through a wire. Amp is the unit given to the rate of flow of electricity going through the wire. And ohm is the unit that is given to resistance. And as you can see, we've got a cowboy with a lasso around this channel here. And the tighter he makes that channel, the less current that's gonna flow through. The tighter he makes that channel, the more resistance is being applied to that garden hose, if you will. So if we take that cartoon and we take a look at the illustration on the left, we have the battery and it's drawn with long plate, short plate, long plate, short plate, long plate, short plate. Does it matter whether the short plate starts on the left or does it matter whether the short plate starts on the right? The answer is it doesn't matter, but it is drawn this way. So I have a question and you can unmute your microphone to answer this question. In this particular circuit, in which direction will conventional current flow, clockwise or counterclockwise? Conventional current. Clockwise. Thanks. Clockwise. clockwise. Everybody agrees conventional current will flow clockwise. Okay, so conventional current flows clockwise. So it's interesting is these arrows on the wire are showing conventional current, current that leaves the positive side of the source through the circuit going back to the negative side of the source. So what's shown on the wire, this drawing is conventional current and we would describe that as being clockwise. And then they have this thing here, electron flow with this arrow pointing this way. And I think I'm gonna have to take that out of the illustration because I find it not only antagonistic but also somewhat confusing for, for someone uh, because it is it flowing to the left at the top of the circuit or is it flowing to the left at the bottom of the circuit? It's not very clear. So I will take that particular part out. So ignore the electron flow words there in the arrow because that's uh, uh, something I need to edit out. But take a look at the words below. Resistance is shown with what symbol? Capital R, and that's represented by the light bulb. Current is shown by what symbol? Capital I and it's described as the flow of electricity or flow of electrons. Voltage is shown by what symbol? Capital V, and it is the battery. Okay, so far so good. All right, so from here, Khan Academy, we've pretty much paralleled Khan Academy for, for a number of the exercises, uh, and then we'll get into to, uh, our circuits. So on this PowerPoint, which I will publish in, in Canvas. Are there any questions on any of these slides that we have gone through? What's the difference uh, when we use the unit symbols with the, the representations of each, each one we just described? Um, like when we use a unit symbol versus a comp concept symbol? Okay, what are the differences between these? Okay, so here, here's where, uh, let me give you an example of where, what that will be. And the best probably would be with, uh, let's do it here. Let's focus, cool. And so let me give you an example. I will go ahead and draw a schematic. I have illustrated a DC voltage source. And I will come down and bring in a component. This is called a resistor. And I will complete this. So my V is going to be, let's say, 10 volts. My R is going to be mm, 2 with the omega symbol, two ohms, and I am looking for this thing called I. So the V stands for voltage. The R is resistance. 
and the I stands for current. So we use the V, the I, and the R to represent the concept of voltage, the concept of current, and the concept of resistance. Now, if I apply Ohm's law, Ohm's law, and Ohm's law is given by this symbol. I'm gonna draw a circle. And the circle, I'm gonna draw a horizontal line, draw a vertical line. I'm gonna put a V here, I'm gonna put an I here, and I'm gonna put an R here. And this circle describes the relationship, the math relationship between these quantities. The horizontal line means division. So this horizontal line means division. The vertical line means we're gonna multiply. So from here, I can derive three different formulas just by looking at this. I can have a formula for can V. Can you slide the paper up a little bit, please? Yeah, let's uh, go here. Yeah, that way. Let's go here, let's go here. There you go. All right, so I have a V and then I have an I and I have an R. If I want to calculate for V, what do I do is I take my finger and I cover up the V. So when I cover up the V, when I cover up the V, what is left in the relationship between these quantities? I have an I on this side and I have an R on this side, but what was the math of that vertical the math that I said on that vertical line represents multiplication. So this would be V is equal to I times R. If I am looking for I, I take my finger and I cover up the I. What do you see left over? I is equal to a V. Well, what does the horizontal line represent for math? Divide. So this would be V divide by R. If I'm looking for the R, I take my finger and I cover up the R. My R would be equal to the V divide by the I. So from this simple circle, I can derive three different variations of Ohm's law in equation form. Now, I happen to have a scenario that's written here. And so based on this scenario, let's go ahead and solve this and see what can happen. So I would be equal to V over R. So I is equal to what is my V? My V is given as 10 volts. What is my R? My R is given as two, but two what? Do I write two, do I write the capital R here? No, R is the symbol for what? Resistance. But what are the units of resistance? Ohms. ohms. Do I have a symbol for ohms? Yes, I use this, okay? So 10 V divided by two ohms. Now you don't need a scientific calculator to do 10 divided by two. You should be able to figure out that, you know, with mama's calculator. You know what I'm talking about for mama's calculator? Mama's calculator is what she gave you between your ears, right? All right. And so if, uh, if, 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 if that fails you between your two ears, then you better talk to mama. And if you talk to mama, she'll probably do like my mama did to me, slap me upside my head. So I never complain about mama's calculator to her. So 10 divided by two will give us five. But what do I write here? Do I write five I? No, I is the symbol for current, but what are the units of current? Well, according to our chart, the units for current is amps or amperes, yes? So what is the symbol for amperes? Capital A. And that would be the answer. And that's how you would use the omega. That's how you would use the A when we go to do a circuit analysis. So did that answer, did that help to answer some of your questions pertaining to that, that electronic symbol chart? You know, where do we use the A? Where do we use the I? Where do we use the R, the omega? Where do we, you know, does this help you out some? Will you? Yes, thank you. Okay. And as um, I have a question. Zero. Yes. What Please. happens if the resistance is zero? What happens if the resistance is zero? Then this guy goes to infinity and you will have you will have shorted out your uh, voltage source. 
So we will have a, if the resistance is zero, this is what happens. Watch what happens when I bring the resistance to zero. I will go ahead and take a wire. And I will jump a wire from here to here, like a paper clip. And so now, if you, if you take a look at this, my negative side of the source, this is my positive side of the source, take a look at the electrons. The electrons will leave here, come down, come down, go here, and guess what? It hits this connection point. On one side of the connection point, I've got resistance of two ohms. On the other side of the connection point, I've got this, this green wire, this staple, or this paper clip that fell into my computer somehow, and this has got zero ohms. Wow. Well, you're driving the current bus. You've got pressure to move electricity. Which way do you think the electricity is going to flow if given a choice between some ohms versus no ohms? The no ohms? No, no ohms. Precisely. So your, your electricity will flow. Let me use red. The electricity will flow right through this wire, bypassing the resistor, coming up here, coming up here, coming up here, and guess what? Going back to the source. So guess what you've done? What we've, what we've done here is by, by replacing this with a zero ohms, by putting a wire in here, we have created something known as, my friends, it is called a dead short. It's a short circuit, but a very special short circuit called a dead short because we have killed our voltage source. So very much like if you were jumping um, uh, with jumper cables, uh, car batteries between car A versus car B, you know better from uh, previous experience not to take your jumper cables and connect red to black together, yes? Because if you do so, what would happen to the car battery? They would be called a what? A dead short zero ohms. So what would happen briefly is that the current will go to infinity until this thing blows up. <laughs> Almost infinity, because there's some internal resistance in that voltage source. Okay. Okay, thank you. Very good. I appreciate the question. All right. Any other, does this help to answer uh, omegas and amps and V's and I's and R's. And we'll, we'll do more of this as, uh, as uh, uh, our work progresses. Okay, cool. We'll take a departure from here. And what I want to talk about is uh, your lab and uh, how to do your lab and what's assigned. So let's take a moment from here. I will call up Canvas. All right, so several things, bookkeeping with respect to Canvas and something that we will be using for our official correspondence. Let me go to my Canvas screen and share that with you because this is our learning management system. I will go to this screen and boom. All right, is everybody able to see my Canvas screen? Raise your hands. Cool, all right. And as you're looking at my Canvas screen, when you are on your dashboard, you will see options of different classes that you have. You click on our class, which is Electronic Systems Tech 50. When you click on this guy from your dashboard, you should be able to see a page that looks something like this. And I'm gonna go to Student View, so it'll eliminate some of the background stuff that you don't need to see that might be distracting. All right, so this is what you are looking at from the student side. So there is a start here. There is textbooks, websites, syllabus, and then week one. And then all the other weeks should be, should be compressed into their respective folders, okay? So we should start off our view in the home uh, and in this particular view. Um, the start here, I won't go over this again because I did this on Friday and it's also on our YouTube, um, some welcoming stuff that you should be familiar with. Our textbooks we had talked about uh, and the highly recommended one, which is in our Discord uh, chat as being available to you uh, free. 
and syllabus you've seen many times. So week one overview, let's take a look at week one because here's where the guts of our work will be. So the very first thing that we are asked to do is the Khan Academy setup, that's worth 25 points. Uh, due date is by tomorrow, you should be able to set up the account. Now, then you have the Khan Academy tasks. So the Khan Academy setup, since not everybody has done so, this information is exactly the same as was in your syllabus. You click this link, you use this particular class code, you hit add, and if you read this carefully, you create a username that is uh, last name, comma, first name. That way it helps me recognize you. The completion of creating your account is 25 points. <clears throat> then we have specific tasks. And I commend you, uh, more than half of you have finished all these tasks already, but here are the tasks. There's 12, don't be scared, because some of these are videos, some of these are short articles, and some of these are math uh, exercises. Oh, that horrible word, that four letter word, math. Fear not, the math is middle, middle school to early high school level math and decimals, dividing, multiplying decimals, dividing decimals, understanding what hundredths is, exponents, what scientific notation is. We'll talk more about that and actually use that on our calculator later. Uh, electrical units are indicated here. Numbers used in electrical engineering. So these are good articles. And then some things we talked about in our PowerPoint. Um, order of operations, again, sixth grade level order of operations. So pretty basic stuff. And as I said, more than half of you have already completed all 12 of these. It's worth 120 points. And what's the due date on this? By Monday midnight, okay? So you've got plenty of time to get this done. Then as we move along, mosey on down, the next thing we encounter is breadboard tutorial, multimeter tutorial, and resistor color coding tutorial. These are all new. Um, each one of these is created just a couple days ago, if not yesterday. So let's take a look at the breadboard tutorial because we're about to jump into this. And if we open this up, do you see this blue submit button? The blue submit button says you got 25 points that you're gonna have to upload a file. And here's the file that you have to complete. So if I go to click on this guy, it should, and the breadboard fill-in happens to have a link that is described. Ah, come here, go away. Okay, the link is here and the document is here in Canvas. So the link takes us here. SparkFun is uh, a really wonderful site created by a couple of guys who are electronic geeks that wanted to build the electronic projects, but didn't have good resources. So what did they do? They started a company to uh, make resources available to us. And then they've also created some tutorials. This goes to show you how to use a breadboard. What is a breadboard? Here's what's shown as a, a short breadboard. And there's many different kinds of breadboards. Is they, they'd love to sell you stuff. So they, they have their little advertising here. But go past that. Go past this. And now history. And history, you know, prior to the 1960s, if you wanted to experiment, what did you do? You would use something called wire wrap. Guess what the first question is? Blank, blank was a technique used to build electronic circuits prior to the 1960s. What are you going to fill in that blank, blank, according to that first sentence of history? Wire wrap. Wire wrap. Okay. Is that pretty easy? Okay. Take a look at question number two. Uh, blank is the process of testing out an idea by creating a preliminary model from which other forms are developed and is what breadboards are used for. Wow. Well, let's take a look. If I go down a little further, what's in the name? There's a breadboard, breadboard, breadboard. And right here, boldface type. If you read this sentence, and let me magnify this so you can see this a little bigger. All right. You see this a little bigger? What's 
the same boldface type. Blank blank is the process of testing out an idea by creating a preliminary model from which, wow, what do you think you're going to fill in question number two with? Prototyping. Prototyping. So all you have to do to fill in this homework assignment really is just to go through the tutorial about breadboards. So I'm not going to fill in this answer sheet for you, but let's go through the highlights of this tutorial because we're going to talk about building our lab components, our lab circuits in just a moment. Here's a really nice illustration showing a breadboard with a chip <clears throat> across the uh, the dip support groove. This little groove in the middle of the board is used for dip support. And we happen to have our power rails, which are indicated by these long red lines and the blue lines. We typically use this part of the board for power. And we have power on the top of the board. We have power on the bottom of the board. And we use the middle area here for building our component, uh, our circuits, <coughs> and, and by inserting our components. And the nice thing about the breadboard is it is what we call solderless. You don't have to use anything other than your fingers to push the components onto the breadboard. Anatomy of the breadboard, these are called power rails. These are called terminal strips, these parts in here. Your dip support is this groove because that's where the channel that you're going to be putting your chip across. And some breadboards have binding posts. <clears throat> the terminal strips, this is what you see on the top of the board, but underneath the board, there happens to be these metal strips underneath. These metal strips have a nice, they're, they're, it's a spring clip. This is the anatomy of the actual clip itself. So the wire that comes in through these holes will make contact in between these two tines of the clip. Well, as they come five in a row and they're built in way, guess what? These holes are connected to each other underneath the board five in a row. Is this first row on the bottom of the red breadboard in any way electrically connected to the row above it? Yes or no? Is there any electrical connection no. between this? None. They are completely separate metal strips, as you can see from the back side of the board. And that's what you're going to be testing in a little while uh, when we get to our, our uh, circuit board. And then is there, any, is there any continuous connection between this bottom row, between this bottom row of tie points, uh, if I call these, these would be called tie points, and this set of tie points over here the left set of five and the right set of five. Is there any direct physical connection, electrical connection? No. no. None. Because as you can see here, this group of five is separate from this group of five. So you will be verifying this pattern <clears throat> of electrical connections on your breadboards very shortly. Very important part for us to understand. Okay. And <clears throat> moving right along, our LEDs, <clears throat> one wire is long, one wire is sh short. The longer wire, like the longer plate of your voltage source, is the positive side, and the shorter wire is the negative side of the LED. And we've connected one on one side of the dip support groove and the other wire on the other side of the dip support groove. So the dip support groove simply separates this group of tie points from this group of tie points. And the power rails from the top are shown with the red and blue stripes. And from the bottom, that metal channel is all the way down. For most boards, it's all the way down. For some long boards, they are broken in half so that the, this half is not continuous with the lower half. Uh, so it, you'll, you'll have to follow the markings on your board. For the boards that we have in our kit, the blue rail and red rails are solid all the way from top to bottom. And if we only have one power supply, which is what's previously shown in earlier photographs, if we only have one power supply and we wanted to activate the power rails on the other side, we would use something called what? What does this say? Two, what kind of wires? Jumper wires. Wow. Yeah, jumper wires. So notice that the red is connected to the red channel and the black wire is connecting to the blue stripe, 
negative rail to the blue stripe negative rail, okay? Do not mix these up, otherwise you'll have horrible results. And dip support is done by the groove, that ravine for the chips. And then we have rows and columns, and there are, most boards are, are numbered rows one through 30 and column A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and J. So like bingo, uh, there's, there's numbers and markings on the board. So if you had to go to a very specific point, you could. Binding posts may occur on some boards. Some are mini boards, medium boards, and then long boards, and then much larger boards. Binding posts go to show one way of hooking up your wires. And then there's power supplies, breadboard power supplies. And you have a more sophisticated version of a power supply than this. We'll talk about this separately. This works better than a nine volt battery uh, hooked up to your board or a battery pack hooked up to your board. Why? This is called a regulated power supply. Regulated because there's a special IC chip here with other electronic components that will guarantee you will have a steady either five volts on the board or 3.3. This is selectable. Whereas if you use the battery, the battery would drain. So we would have inconsistent results. So this is the first time your group is the very first group ever, ever, ever to have uh, this sophisticated onboard power supply that's regulated. Okay. And building the circuit. All right. Well, that's enough for that tutorial. Let's talk about building the circuit. And I've got to give you another break and I've got to take care of more bookkeeping. So I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to pause the recording. Get my mouse back over and pause the recording. I'm sorry, I put us on pause recording because we were taking a break. All right, so let me refocus this. Okay, I love this doc cam. All right, so this is being recorded and we are going to be building our very first circuit. So as I've said, you take your power supply, your regulated power supply, and you very carefully, without bending these pins, line them up to positive and negative rails. And I've lined mine up this way so that I have very little overhang. I don't have no overhang of the board off the edge of the breadboard. And then very gently press together. And so while I press it together, what I've got is I've got my red line at the top and I've got my blue line at the bottom. This particular power supply connector here, I've put in the off position, and this jumper over here, I've put in the five volt position. Your kit comes with a really nice, come here, comes with a really, really nice USB to USB cable. And what you do with the USB to USB cable is, and I've shown most people on Friday, is you get your wall wart, which is what you use for hooking up your, your, your cell phones for uh, power. You take one end of the USB, you pop it into your wall wart, and the wall wart goes into an extension cord or some, some ability for power, and the other end of the USB goes in here. Now, for, for my demonstration purposes, for me, this is a little short and a little cumbersome. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this. I get about six feet of cord here. So this is a longer USB and uh, easier to manage. And I will pop that in there. We'll pop that in there only when we're ready for power. I don't recommend powering it up and leaving it in there. But if I push this in for power right now, I can test it and light, press the button. Yeah, the green light lights up. That means I've got power. If I press this, the green light goes off. I've got no power. Um, when you go to insert the USB, hold the board down on your breadboard, carefully plug it in, carefully unplug it, never just jam in freely because what will happen is you'll rip the pins on the bottom of this board right off of the circuit board and you will have destroyed your power supply. So always hold on to the power supply, 
board firmly, then insert your USB when you're ready or detach the USB when you're done with it. Okay. All right. So I'm going to leave mine off because it simply gets in the way. Now, what I said about the resistors is find the one that says 100 ohms. So everybody, find one that says 100 ohms. And when you find the one that says 100 ohms, and open it up carefully. And when you go to pull it out very carefully, you'll find that these resistors are all attached to each other with masking tape at the top and the bottom. And all we want, all we want is a singular resistor. So I'm going to use the wire cutters from my kit. I'm going to cut right here. And I'm going to cut right here. I'm going to cut right about there. So I now have a resistor right there. That's a 100 ohm resistor. And what I'm going to do with this 100 ohm resistor is I'm going to use a pair of needle nose and I'm going to pre-bend this. So I'm going to take this guy, you can see it's nice and shiny, come right up near the resistor end, grab this and give it a nice right angle bend. Can everybody see that nice right angle bend there? Got a nice right angle bend there. And I'm going to do the same to the other side. So I'm going to grab this, come over here and do the same bend. And now what I've created is a resistor. If I can, uh, can you see that better now? Okay. So I've got a resistor that is now cut and bent and will go into the board very, very easily. So what I want to do in this particular case will be to take this particular guy and I will go ahead and connect it. Oh, let's say I'm going to connect this to row 20 like so. Oop. So I'm going to have one side of this on row 20. And then the other lead of the resistor on the other side on any, it doesn't matter which hole it goes into any tie point, also on row 20. So you're going to do that with your 100 ohm resistor. And if you, if what some people have done is with their resistors, they've just taken it off the, uh, the, the, the masking tape on one side, taking it off the masking tape on the other side, bend it and shove it in their boards. I don't recommend that if you can, if you can snip the resistors like I have, you're, you're better off doing it this way because there's a little bit of residue that clings to the ends of these wires. And unless you take that, that residue off carefully, you don't want to get that residue into your breadboard. So I find clipping and cutting gives you a much more satisfactory result. So once I'm done with removing one of these, I'm going to insert this back in my bag and seal this up and set that aside. So far, so good. The next thing I'm going to do is um, I'm going to get my jumper wire. So I'm going to reach in here and go ahead and grab a jumper wire. And the nice thing about using a needle nose is notice how I'm holding the needle nose pliers. The needle nose pliers are not held in the conventional manner of grabbing it this way, not holding this way, but rather inverting it in my hands so that it's always pointing down. So as it's pointing down, it makes it easier for me to snip and grab things that I want very quickly, like so. So I've grabbed a, a jumper wire. I happen to pick yellow in this case. It happens to be good size. And I'm going to connect it to row 20 and the blue rail. It's going to go in like that. So can everybody see those connections so far? There and there and here and here. In fact, I'm going to bring this down further, right down as close as I can get. Let me refocus. Love it. Okay, cool. Professor? Yes, my friend. Um, what would you suggest we use if we don't have pliers right now? Um, small fingers. Okay. 
What you can do, if you don't have your needle nose pliers or something handy, what you can do is uh, you can just bend them by hand uh, and that'll work out just fine. So okay. that's what I did here. If you look at this board here, this board here goes to show that these are all bent by hand. Mm -hmm. and, and that's fine. It, it'll still work. They happen to be, and I didn't cut these. I didn't trim these down. I just took the resistors and bent them. Boom, 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 boom. And then I ended up with something that looks like this U shape. And then I jam it on the board like so. And so what if they're elevated? It does not matter. So sometimes the boards may end up with components that look like this and that's perfectly okay. But I'm showing you the neatest way possible and uh, it may take a little more time, but you'll be very happy with the results. Uh, if you do it this way, no problem at all. It's still very clear to see what's hooked up where, how and why and to what. So if you don't have needle nose pliers, you can end up doing this. This is perfectly fine. Okay, did that answer that question for you? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you for asking that question. It's a good question. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab me an LED. So from the LED case, this is so nice. You got so many LEDs with this particular guy. Um, grab me a nice, uh, let's do a blue one this time. And any case that you open, please close before you put it aside. Same thing here, this particular guy, close before you put it aside. Never leave any of these cases open. I can't tell you how many times I've had people cry in the lab when they've left these open and they accidentally got bumped off the table. Can you imagine picking all of this up off the floor? It's crazy. So close these, set them aside, close this, set this aside. Now let's talk to you about your LEDs. Your LEDs have a long lead and they have a short lead. Guess what? Which one, is, which one is positive? What did I say? It's the same as your plates of the voltage source. It is what to be long? It is long to be positive. It is positive to be long. Positive to be long and it is negative to be short. Same idea with these guys. So the positive side of the LED is the long lead and the negative side of the LED is the short lead. Now there's technical names for these. One is technically called anode, one is called cathode. We'll talk more about that in detail when we get into the construction of an LED and how it truly works. So what I suggest for us to do is just very gently, very gently splay these apart with just a little bit of a gap, not much. Maybe that's too much. So something like that, just a tiny bit. Because what we wanna do is this. We want to put the negative side of the LED, the short lead of the LED, attached to some point on row 20 for this resistor. So I'm gonna attach it right here. And then the other side can go to, in this case, row 22. So this is what I've done with my LED. Is that reasonably clear on your screens? So right now, Black negative power rail to row 20, and then this is connected to the resistor on row 20. This jumps over the groove, and on the side on row 20 is the negative lead, the short lead of the LED. The long lead of the LED is on row 22. And then I'm going to take my other jumper wire, which I'll also use yellow, and I'm going to go to row 22. And you can pinch these together or move these slightly apart. And it goes in like so. So now, as I'm showing this to you in various angles, can you see I've got the power rail, positive side of the power rail, connected here with this yellow jumper, yellow jumper to row 22. On row 22, th three pins over, is the positive side of the LED. The positive side of the LED, if you recall, was the longer lead. Okay, here's the longer lead. So that's gonna go on row 22. The shorter lead will go on row 20. So the longer lead here, the shorter lead there. And then I gotta make sure that the LED and the resistor are solidly connected on row 20, there and there. 
Can you see that? And then the resistor jumps over the groove and the resistor on this side makes connection with this part of the jumper here. Is that circuit construction clear enough for you to see on your screens? Yes. Yeah. And, uh, focus, okay. Okay. And the reason for the uh, re resistor, that's a 100 ohm resistor, all LEDs must be connected in series, meaning the same current path, one current path. All LEDs must be connected with a series resistor for limiting the current. So that's the, the function of this resistor now is to be a current limiting resistor. It will restrict the amount of current flowing through the LED so we don't burn it up. If we don't use a resistor here, if we hook up straight wires from the positive to the negative on a full five volts, we could burn out that resistor, that LED, and then it would be useless to us. Okay? Okay. Any questions about that circuit build so far? And remember, before I go to insert this USB, I have to hold on to my power supply firmly, gently guide in my USB cable, light it up. The power indicator on my power board lights up, the LED lights up. Press the button, it goes off. Press the button, it goes on, off, on, off, on, off. So. What happens if you change the resistance? I'll show you that in a moment. Okay. The question is, what would happen if we change the resistance? Interesting that you would ask that question. We'll talk about that in a moment, but are there any questions regarding this circuit build? Were you able to do this with the components in your kit and does it look nice and neat and clean like so? And most importantly, does it light up? How bright, should it, how bright should it be? Mine's pretty dull looking, but I got it to light up. Yeah, it's pretty dull looking. You got it to light up. If you're using the resistor from your 100 ohm pack, and you've got to be careful, you got to make sure this says 100 with the omega, not 1000, not 10,000, not 100. There better not be a K in here, okay? It has to be 100 with the omega. If you pulled your resistor from any other pack, it might be too much resistance and might give you a very dim LED. But if you, as long as your power supply is set to the five volt position here, then you are powering this appropriately. Yeah, that's exactly what I did. I accidentally pulled from the 100K. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's what would happen. Okay. You've got way so Sorry, much resistance. <laughs> Don't worry, no, that, that's, that's, that's how we learn. That's how we learn, and that's you got to ask questions. Is it, my LED is a little dim. I don't, it doesn't look quite as bright as Co's LED. There, what's going? On? Then you ask the question. That's a really good question because somebody else might be experiencing the same thing, but they might be shy <laughs> and not um, as 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 prone to uh, raising their hands and asking a question. Are there any other questions regarding this particular circuit build? I have a Did question. It take us, or, yes, please. Um, so for the photos that we take with our uh, boards, I tried just now, and it's the LED is so bright that the rest of the board doesn't really show up. Do you have any advice there? Should we take a picture with the light off? Um, no, you're going to need to do this uh, with a lot, lot of light. What it looks like. In your, uh, in your room. <laughs> Mine is much brighter um, now. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing what a, what a resistor will do. Let me show you, for example, uh, let, let me come back to Susan's. Uh, here's Susan's. Okay. So in Susan's, let's come back here. Her surface of the table is really bright. Okay. So she's got a lot of light in the room. As long as you've got a lot of light in the room, the brightness of the LED will not. I see your screen. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. Okay. <laughs> I get so excited. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, let's go here. Thank you. 
There we go. All right. So if we take a look at Susan's, um, she's got a lot of light in her room. And as she's got a lot of light in her room, the, 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 the area around her board is very well lit. And so the brightness of the LED does not wash out the picture. And so I would say, and what, what some people have done is if you don't have a bright illuminated source in the room is uh, sometimes the, the, the brightest, for, for a lot of people, the brightest lighting in a home is the bathroom. And I've had people do some really nice uh, selfie pictures in the bathroom where it's nice and bright. Uh, and their picture, they hold the camera right up to the mirror so they can see the circuit board and their face is in the reflection and it works out really, really well. Okay. So you might think about that. So experiment a little, but the bottom line is I can't tell that this is working unless the LED is lit. Because I would see a, I would see a circuit build like this image here on my screen, and it could be built correctly, but unless that LED is lit, perhaps the power is not jumpered properly, or perhaps the, the LED might be backwards. Uh, so even though the wiring looks good, I can't tell that the circuit is working as it should unless the LED is lit. So yeah, the LEDs have to be lit. And uh, yeah, if you uh, experiment in, in different parts of your house or try to get more lighting on the board, you'll be able to get uh, less washout from the, um, from the LED being lit. So I can experiment here on my own desk with you for just a moment. Let me go ahead and do this. Let's take us off the share. And I have a different lighting source. And so if I do this, oops break anything here and I weight this down like so yeah okay and then if I go to do this yeah it's 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 really bright now if I go and do this bring this guy here move this guy over move some that's out of the way Okay, I've got a stronger illumination of light onto this board, and so the brightness of the LED does not wash out the, the circuit wiring as much as if I had this. So if I remove my lighting, that, that LED is so bright, I, it's hard to see the wiring. But if I have a good light source, I can have the LED lit. And you'll find this to to be the case only with the very first circuit. <laughs> the very first circuit has one 100 ohm uh, resistor and one LED. This is as bright as bright can be. It won't, it won't get any brighter than this, all right? Because in subsequent circuits that we're building, uh, we're splitting up that voltage to um, across different components and you won't suffer quite as, as uh, uh, overpowering um, an illumination from your LED. Good question. Now, another classmate had asked the question also, what happens if we change the value of the resistance? Well, let's go back for a moment to this picture. You're, you're still looking at my, uh, let me go to my share screen, I'm sorry. Do, 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 do. Go here and go here and go here. So on my share screen, you can see our little cartoon symbols. If we change the value of resistance, we change how tight that lasso is around that tube that restricts the amount of current that flows. So the amount of current that flows is what determines how bright your LED will be. So since this is a small 100 ohm resistor, the lasso that is currently around this hose is very loose. It's allowing a lot of current to flow through that green amp guy is going like gangbusters. And that's why your LED is so bright. But when we go to change the ohms, you know, what would happen if we change the ohms? When we go to change the ohms, we will start to restrict this uh, hose. And the lasso will be tighter and tighter and there will be less and less current flowing through. And so you will find that for your circuit build forthcoming, and I think I have it in D, is it D? I think it's D. Yeah. 
D. D1. Let's take a look at D1. Aha, here we go. Can everybody see my circuit D? D.1. D.1 shows the build and it's being built with a 100 ohm resistor on the far left, is being built with a 330 ohm resistor in the middle, and is being built with a 2 kilo ohm resistor on the right. All three of these are identical green LEDs. And then I've got jumper wires that take us back to the negative rail. So I've got three resistors in an arrangement called parallel. So these are parallel paths for electricity to flow. And the only difference is I've got different amounts of resistance. So this will help answer your classmate's question. What happens if I change the resistance? Well, I've got three different resistors here, same LED, same five volt power supply, going to ground rail on the other side. Watch what happens in three, uh, circuit D.2. Circuit D.2 appears like so here's D.2. Let me open it up. There they are. And from this perspective, it's clear, hopefully you can see, that the 2 kilo ohm, the 2K stands for kilo, which is 1,000. The 2,000 ohm resistor on the far right produces an LED illumination that is the lowest of all three. Even though this LED is closest to the lens of the camera, it's nowhere near as bright as the other two. If you look closely at the middle one, the middle one is almost at this angle, almost the same intensity as the one on the far left. But in the third angle, you'll see quite a bit of difference. So here's my third perspective. Yes, right here. Here we go. So from this angle, the 100 ohm resistor, lowest amount of resistance, gives me the highest amount of current, the brightest illumination. 330 is like three times the resistance of the first resistor. We have less current. We have more constriction of that current flow, less illumination. Over here, I have 2,000 ohms. That's 20 times the resistance of the first resistor. I'm restricting the current quite a bit more and do I have even less illumination? Does that help answer your question visually and uh, of, of what would be the effect of changing the resistor? That good? Okay, hopefully that answers the question for everybody. You also happen to have another Quite a few nifty things in here. I hadn't planned on having this guy be part of tonight's discussion, but since someone asked the question, let me go to unshare the screen and go back to my circuit board and move this aside for a moment and get this particular component box open because I want a very special device from this component box. Let me see which one of these I'm going to use. I think I'm going to use this guy right here. This particular guy is a variable resistor. It's also known as a potentiometer. And as it is a variable resistor, we'll be able to see the effect of this guy on this circuit if we continuously change the amount of voltage. And so I'm going to do this you know, quick and dirty here. I'm going to yank this resistor out. I'm going to put in a jumper wire there. And I'm going to jam one end of this uh, pot so that it is here. And this one goes here. OK. Can you see, if I put a screwdriver in here, can you see, I've adjusted this potentiometer, the knob, it's the dimmer knob on uh, your, your radio, your, your television set. Right now, it's maximum resistance 
and that's the lowest illumination I have. If I go to reduce my resistance, the current will increase, the current will increase. I believe it goes this way. Do I have it the right way? Oh, this way, sorry. There we go. This way gives me maximum illumination. This way, diminished illumination. So here's an example of a variable resistor that we can change by rotating the knob for minimum resistance and maximum resistance. Can you all see the effect of that? Okay, so that's a pretty good demonstration of resistance and a, a, you know, a good reason why it's very handy to have this type of jumper wire around because yes, it could take me a few minutes to lay down the, the, the pre-cut, pre-bent ones to make this look really pretty, but I just wanted to do this very quickly, jump and make this example for us and uh, demonstrate the effect of a variable resistance. Any questions about this? Good question. Any other general question regarding circuit building? Um, I have a question. Yes. Uh, what do we do with the resistors after we're done? When you're done, the specific resistors that you pull out, you will put back into the respective bag. So in the 100 ohm bag, I happen to have already two previously pre-cut, I've cut, I've cut and bent the resistors and I put them into the bag for future use. This is also a 100 ohm resistor. I will go ahead, open it. Thank you very much for muting your microphone. <laughs> I will then take this particular fellow and insert it into the bag, like so, and that way we will reuse it for a future experiment, okay? So we don't throw these guys away and unless we burn them out. We will continue to reuse them uh, and just save them in the bag. Did that answer your question? Um, kind of, because my resistor has, or my bag with the resistor with the 100, um, it has like multiple resistors. It's yes, like, it does. So does mine, right? Like, can you see my like camera? It has like different levels. So like. Oh. Did you buy our kit? You bought a different kit. But, um, I bought the one that was recommended. And it came that way. That's it. okay. Yeah. This is what you do. You go to your kitchen. Okay. And you get extra little plastic baggies. Okay. <laughs> there, I have extra little plastic baggies, and I put other components in, and and um, you know, one plastic baggie for this, one plastic baggie for that, and call it a day. So that's what your little sandwich plastic baggies are good for. If yours didn't happen to come uh, just with a, um, a separate packed this way. If you had multiples as yours shows, that's okay. That's what I've done here is I have separate baggies. And in other instances, in other instances, uh, after the next break, I think I'll go grab uh, one of my other kits and show you another way of managing your resistors. Good question. Any other questions about circuit building? These are good questions. Okay. We're up for our uh, last break. So let's go ahead and take uh, our 10, go stretch a leg, throw some water on your face, and after we come back, we'll wrap up the evening. I will remain for any questions that anybody has while we're on break. Oops, I have to change my, um, I'm fuzzy again. Somebody needs to let me know. Okay, as we're on break, anybody have any questions? Should we take apart the circuit that we just built and put the parts back? Uh, yes, I would. Uh, you know, well, actually, uh, the, the um, yes, once you've taken a picture of it uh, from, from various angles, yes. Uh, I'm going to turn off the power supply, go ahead and detach my cord, and uh, start removing the components and putting them away. Professor? Yes. What was the proper way to put in the variable resistor? Uh, uh, good question. Okay. So here's the thing about the variable resistor and probably best explained this way. I think I burned a battery. 
<laughs> okay. Um, you can see my camera screen and a piece of paper. Uh, let's go ahead and do this very quickly. All right. Good question. So this was, okay, that's reasonably good focus. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this. Your variable resistor electronically works this way, it has three terminals. So we will call this one, two, and three. And the knob is what moves this wiper from one side to the other. So we can change the amount of resistance of this guy. So this particular guy, let's see what it's printed as. It's printed as a 10K ohm. So this is 10,000 ohms for this particular guy, otherwise known as 10 kilo ohms. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Right, I'm gonna and, ask, um, it's kind of hard to see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to refocus it. <laughs> And let me bring this down a little bit more so we can see a little more closely. How about that? Okay. So by moving the knob, we're moving the position of the wiper so we can change the amount of resistance between the middle and these outside pins. So this side could end up to be 2K and this side could be end up to be 8K. This could be 1K and this would be 9K. Or if I put it in the middle, this would be 5K and this would be 5K. All we need for a potentiometer are two out of the three pins. So in this particular case, this particular potentiometer, if I pull this guy out, happens to have a pin arrangement like so. In other words, it is pinned here, here, and here. So this would be pin one, this would be pin two, and this would be pin three. And all I need is one and two or two and three. I don't need all three pins. And so since these happen to fit on the board very nicely, one row apart, I've positioned this potentiometer on this board, my cell phone, on this board, such that, uh, and let me get right down to the board and refocus. Cool. And uh, let me put in a different kind of jumper. So we can see this a little more clearly. Okay. I'm going to come out sideways like so. Okay. So I'm going to put the potentiometer between row 21 and 20. All I need is two out of these three pins to go between 21 and 20. So I'm going to take this guy and line it up so that I have it like so. I'm going to hold this at this angle, and hopefully you can see with the amount of lighting that we have in here. Uh, let me pull this out a little further, maybe at this angle. I think at this angle you can see this. Let me switch this around this way so you can see better. There we go, like that. Cool. So what I've got is from the negative side, uh, I've got a jump wire to row 20. On row 20, I'm connected to the middle pin, pin number two. And you can see that little metal shaft in there. Pin number three is just one row over. And it's making contact with this jumper wire over here. So that means I'm forcing the electricity to flow from the negative side, negative rail, through row 20, into the potentiometer on its middle pin, out of the third pin of the potentiometer into this blue jumper wire. Push this guy down. Make a quick connection between here and here. And reinsert my power. Um, oh, silly me, I need a resist, uh, I need an LED, I put my LED down. Okay, so LED goes from here to here, and this guy from here. And now it lights up. Stop. 
And so now if I go to turn this pot, I should be able to see a difference of illumination of this guy. Yeah. Brighter, dimmer, brighter, dimmer, brighter. Okay. So that is one solution of how that potentiometer would go on the board. And the way it went on to the board, to reiterate, is we only need two out of three pins of the pot to make connection on the board. And I'm using pins number one, I'm using number two and number three in this case. And in here, let me hold this at an angle where you can see this again. I'm gonna pull this out so you can see this a little better. And just by how it catches the light, hopefully you can see ground to pin 20. Pin 20 on row 20, I've got pin number two of the pot right there. And you can see a little bit of reflection off of pin number three of the pot as it goes into row 21. And on row 21, I've got this jumper coming off to the side and then through this jumper to the LED. Does that help answer your question of how to connect the potentiometer onto the board? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Good question. Okay, cool. All right. And now, back from break. All right. Board away. Clean that up later. And one of your later builds, since I happen to have it out, is this one here. This one is your circuit E. Circuit E is what we call a series parallel circuit. And as a series parallel, I'm going from the red power rail down here in a singular current path to this resistor to the first LED. So the first LED and the first resistor are in the same current path. That's what makes them in series. Once we hit this particular row, uh, then we have these jumper wires, which go sideways. And these are kind of like a red power rail here, but not using the red power rail. I'm using these jumper wires to take our electricity from here to the, to the first LED, uh, to the second LED, second resistor, to the third LED, to the third resistor. And then if I transfer my power supply to over here and hook up the power and light it up, it lights up appropriately. So that is your live demonstration of circuit E. E.3, E.1. E.3, E.1. So the first one, anything that's a, a A.1, B.1, those are, are non-illuminated, so you can get a good view of different, as, as good an angle as I can get for any of these, uh, so you can see the wire connections. But the, uh, uh, the illuminated ones are the ones that we're going to need for uh, your uploading. OK. So now that I've put those guys away, any questions regarding your circuit components which you need to build? That's worth how many points, my friends? 100 points. All right, so my speaker's not working again. I apologize. Let me see what's going on with that. OK, how's my sound now? So far, so good. OK, all right. Uh, at least I don't see an error on the screen. Good. Now, uh, in addition to all of that, we had talked about, let's take a look at Canvas real fast that takes care of your circuit boards. So let's go back to share screen. Do, 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 do. All right, so we are looking at Canvas. So we talked about the breadboard tutorial, we did the breadboard exercise. There is a separate tutorial on your multimeter. Uh, so when you go to open up this particular part of Canvas, it'll open up like so. There's Mark Fun tutorial, and there's also multimeter fill-in. So let's open up this guy so you can see what this looks like. I lost boxes, so 
question. Okay, we're well, done with Susan. Thank you. Can I ask a question about breadboards before we move on? Oh, sure. Yes, please. Um, I was looking at circuit build B. Circuit build B, yes. What about circuit build B? How can I answer your question for you? Um, in the photo, I was just wondering what's kind of going on on row 20, because I'm not sure if that's part of the build. Oh, uh, I didn't write that one up. Let me go in and, and go back and select that one for us so we can all look at the same thing. Okay. Good question. Yeah, any questions that pop up? Now's the best time to ask while we're all looking at the same thing. So, student photo uploads. Okay. So, in circuit build B, is that nice and big for everybody? Oops. There we go. All right. And now let's zoom in. Now I have a bigger frame to work with. Woo -hoo. All right. Nice and big. So we happen to have the red power rail here. This one's jumping over. If this is 35, row 35, and this is 40, this must be row 35, 36, 37. It was arbitrary. I happened to pick number 37. It lands wherever it lands. The important thing is wherever you choose to put it on your board, you must have a power connection from the red rail to a tie point, whatever row it lands on. And in this particular photo, it lands on row 37 that has to connect to the long lead of the LED because that's the positive side of the LED. The other side of the LED lands on row 39 in this case, just two rows over. You really don't want to splay your LED wires any farther than, than two rows apart unless they go over the, uh, the groove. If they go over the groove, then they're splayed a little further apart. But generally on the tie point part of your board, you want to have them no further than say two apart. So here's the negative side of my LED. The first LED goes into a jumper wire. The electricity flows over to this row. This row happens to be 43. And it connects to the positive side of this LED, comes up through the LED to row 45. That's the negative side of the LED. Then it connects to my 100 ohm resistor, jumps over the groove, and makes connection with my final jumper that goes to my negative side of the supply. So that is my singular current path, one current path for two LEDs to be illuminated with only one resistor current limiting between them. Okay, so we don't need to worry about row 20 and 18 that's in the photo, because if you, when you're not zoomed in, there's like something back there. I just wasn't sure if it was part of the assignment. Uh, no, that was purposely left not uh, part of the frame that we're not concerned about. Okay, that cool. was that was the that was the, the wiring that I had that was you know more like spaghetti wire. And the, okay, that's, that's what I call spaghetti wire. The part that <laughs> I wanted to focus on is this part here, as nice and neat and, and trim as you can make it. And the reason why you want to start off, since we happen to have the means of being able to do our boards this way, the more you practice building your circuits this way, when you get into more sophisticated circuit building later on it'll make your circuit building easier for friends to troubleshoot. And that's really where the learning begins. The learning begins when we get back in the laboratory and we're building circuits and classmate B says to classmate X, my circuit's not working right. I think it's built right. So what, what do you do? You just show each other your board. And if it's built this way, it's going to be pretty easy to decipher what's going on. If it looks like a massive spaghetti wire, it's going to be a little harder to troubleshoot. So I encourage you, since we have the means to do it so neatly because of the jumper wire kits and sets that we have, let's try to build our circuits this way, okay? Okay, good question on circuit B. All right. Professor Coe, I have a question. Yes, please, what's your question? Um, I'm looking at the homework assignment. Um, and so for A1 through E1, um, where do we find out the resistor values for those? Uh, A1, okay, the only one that matters for um, resistors is this one here. This is circuit D. Because on all the other ones, if I go back to the other ones, 
uh, go back to this one here. So in circuit A, it's a singular 100 ohm resistor. For circuit B, it's a singular 100 ohm resistor. For circuit C, if I can find it, uh, I guess I didn't open circuit C, it's okay. Circuit C has two 100 ohm resistors. You wanna keep the ohms to be 100 ohms for everything uh, except for this particular guy here. And the, the resistors for the last circuit, the resistors for the last circuit, I did not specify, but I'll let you know right now what they ought to be. The resistors for the last circuit, uh, did I draw that out? I did draw it out, yes. The resistors for circuit E, I did specify. So circuit D has these three in this particular order. And if I go to minimize this and where's my, move this down. Okay, move this out of the way. Move this. Thank you. Here's the schematic I was referring to, I apologize. So we have a five volt source in the schematic. The positive is connected to R1 and the D1 in series. So if you look at my red power rail at the top, my red power rail is connected with the jumper to my first resistor R1 and my first diode D1. They are connected in series. They are a singular current path singular path for electricity to flow until this point. Once we hit this point here where this yellow wire meets this brown jumper wire, the electricity will split. Part of the current will come down through R2D2 and the other part of the current will split through R3D3 here. R2 and, D, R2 and D2 are a green LED and a 220 ohm resistor and then the R3 and D3 over here on the board are diode number three and resistor number three, which is a 330 ohm resistor. So there's only two circuits where we have different value resistors. Circuit D has different value resistors and circuit E has different value resistors. Otherwise circuits A, B, and C are all 100 ohm resistors. Good question. I appreciate the question and thank you for bringing it to my attention that I was pointing, I was moving my mouse and you weren't seeing anything. I apologize. Is everybody now understanding what value resistors need to be where? Any other questions so far? Okay. Um, on Canvas, I see that there's a pretest and a quiz. When are those due? Okay, so the pre uh, the pre quiz pre test whatever we call it is simply uh, it's not scored it's not it, it doesn't count for a grade but you want to participate in it because there's some information that's in Canvas in week one where you can find the answers and some of the answers are found right here in the program overview PowerPoint uh, some of the questions do come from here and this particular PowerPoint goes to give you um, like 16 slides encapsulating what is ESIS, what are some of the uh, things that you're going to find in ESIS. This is an example of what a schedule could look like. And then if we go here, this is uh, uh, the a detail of our associate's degree, uh, the different courses that are recommended. They don't have to be taken in the sequence. This is just simply a, a, a suggestion. Uh, the general ed courses that are required. And then the PowerPoint here, what is ESIS? So some of the questions will come from here for uh, your, your self quiz. That would be one resource for you for the self quiz. The other quiz question will come from your syllabus and other things. So the, generally to answer your question, everything is due either Sunday night or Monday night. We wanna get everything done before our class and all the due dates are specified in almost all places. So here for the Khan Academy setup, 
you have to have it set up by tomorrow midnight. Most everybody's got it done now. Khan Academy assignments, there were 12. It's due on Sunday night, midnight, 120 points. Half of the class is already done with those. Uh, the tutorial fill out, I've shown you that tutorial fill out. Um, and we've gone through the tutorial. Multimeter is what I'm about to go through. 25 points, 25 points. These are all due Sunday midnight, Sunday midnight. Uh, the Ohm's Law practice calculation, some of you did much earlier. That's a really good one. Uh, we'll talk a little bit of that in a moment. And then there's a reading assignment and homework that was modified because <coughs> I pulled some things out of it. Again, uh, there's an electronics units table, which shows the entire table. I've only Okay, so this is the entire electrical units table and sites. Very important information. We've only gone through the first four rows, and the first four rows is all we need to be concerned about for week one. Uh, volts was the units for voltage. Who's it named after? What do you see over here? Alessandro Volta, an Italian physicist. Current is in what units? Amperes or amps. Who's it named after? Andre Marie Ampere, French physicist. Resistance is what units? Ohms. Who's it named after? Georg Ohm, German physicist. Power is in what units? Watts. Who's it named after? James Watt, Scottish engineer and inventor. If you invent something, you can name it after your family name and be famous. So um, for our first week, we only want to be concerned about these first four rows and columns, okay? But I give you the entire uh, set of vocabulary because we will be talking about all of these before our eight weeks is ended, all right? So that's in week one reading assignment. And then there's a exercise here that you're going to upload for 25 points to do Sunday. It's a short exercise. And if you read the table properly, you should be able to answer these questions. And a number of people have, have answered this already. What is the unit of voltage? Wow. What's it say on this chart? You look up, you look up units and you look up volts and bingo, where's that intersection? It says volts. That's what you're going to write down for the word. The word would be volts. So it would be V O, oops, spell it right, co. O-L-T-S. And then what's it say for here? What is the symbol of the unit? You're not going to write volts again. What's the symbol for the unit? You go to the table, and the table says the symbol for volts is what? A capital V. So you go over here, and you type in a capital V. Boom. And what I recommend that you do is yellow highlight these, so it makes it very easy for me to scan and quickly see what your answers are. So does that answer part of your question for homework, when things are due and what this particular assignment has you do? You basically look at this chart and fill in the answers and you yellow highlight them. And then you will, on this page, hit the assignment, submit assignment. So when you click this particular guy, it allows you to choose your file. So you go here and you select choose file and you find where on your thumb drive or your hard drive, you have your particular thing that you want to upload. You select it, you hit open. It's there. Once you see it here, then you click submit assignment. And once you submit assignment, it'll tell you submitting, submitting, submitting. And then it'll say right over here, wow, you get confused with panda bears. How cool is that? It says submitted in the right-hand corner. It tells you the date and time you submitted. And if for some reason you uploaded the wrong thing, you can resubmit the assignment. So this is how you will use Canvas. Canvas is used to find your work, uh, do your work, and then upload your work. Does that answer part of your question uh, regarding due dates and what to do with these assignments. Yeah, thank you. Sure, yeah, happy to do so. Okay, so that was the Ohm's Law assignment. We have a resistor color coding one, and I do need to chat about this. For, uh, and 
right here, resistor color coding. There is reading a resistor, and then there is a nice uh, tutorial uh, that you read through, and then another coding, uh, and then uh, exercise. So let's take a look at the exercise and see what's in front of us. We're going to do a couple of these just to help you out. All right, so this is your resistor color coding exercise. It's a fill-in, and you have some, some figuring to do. So we start here. Standard four-band resistor. We click this particular guy. And as we click this particular guy, we will see the following. Resistors are color-coded with markings or bands that allow you to quickly identify resistance values and tolerance. Using a color chart table will allow you to... Okay, can everybody hear this YouTube and can you see the YouTube? Thumbs up if you can. Okay, I'm going to make this big screen. And play. Determine the value of any common four band resistor. Memorizing this color chart will enable you to become proficient at quickly decoding and using resistors. In a four band resistor, the first two bands represent the digits or significant figures. The third band indicates the multiplier, and the fourth band indicates the tolerance. You read resistor bands beginning with the end that has the most bands. A space between the third and fourth bands also indicates the reading direction. The first band is red, so the first digit value is 2. The second band is violet, so digit 2 is 7. The third band is yellow, so we multiply the first two numbers by 10 to the fourth, or 10,000. Thus, the value of this resistor is 270 kilo ohms with a tolerance of plus or minus 5%. In this example, the first band is orange, so the first digit is 3. The second band is white, so digit 2 is 9. The third band is silver, so we multiply the first two numbers by 10 to the negative second power, or 0.01. In this instance, we would take the 39 and move the decimal point two places to the left, resulting in a value of 0.39 ohms. Thus, the value of this resistor is 0.39 ohms with a tolerance of plus or minus 10%. Now, let's determine what the bands would be on a 15 kilo ohm resistor. Since the first digit is one, the first band would need to be brown. This okay, we're not going to do any reverse engineering. So you can do this on your own, but I'm not going to have you do any reverse engineering, meaning I'm not going to assign a value for you to determine the color code this week. You will be given a color code, and we will decipher the color code for four-band resistors. Then there is a separate tutorial on how to read in general three, four, five, and six band resistors. This particular guy does so here. And fundamentally, this is what we have. The color coding sequence is the same sequence. Black, brown, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, gray, white, gold. So that sequence is the same. And you'll notice on the Word document that you're going to be filling in, I've kind of given you that sequence right here. We have black, brown, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, gray, white, gold, and silver. They are specifically in that order. There is a mnemonic. A mnemonic is a memory tool. Let me make this a little bigger for you because some of you are squinting to see this part of the screen. And there's no need for us to squint. So this is a little bigger for you, yeah? Okay. So the mnemonic, being a memory tool, helps you remember the first letters of the sequence of colors. So if you remember this, bad boys race our young girls, but violet generally wins good sir. It's a silly little saying, but it works. So if you just remember, bad boys race our young girls, but violet generally wins good sir. 
You have two Bs at the very beginning. What's at the end of the spectrum? Black will be at one end of the spectrum. So the first B stands for this B. BLK is the abbreviation I will use, and it represents black, and black represents what numeral? A zero. Is that shown here on the color chart? Is black a zero all the way across? Yes? And then the second B, what is the shade closest to black will be brown. So the second B is going to be brown, abbreviated as BRN, and is given here as brown, spelled out, and is given the value of one. Race, R for race, is R for red, and red represents a two. O for hour is O for orange, and I abbreviate that as ORN for orange, and it represents the value of three. And you can see on the chart here, orange is in fact three. Y for young is the Y for yellow, and I abbreviate with three letters, Y-E-L, and yellow right there, and represents four. G occurs three times. The G, and, the G and the B in the middle of, the, of, of this color sequence are green and blue. Okay, they're very shades that are very close to each other. It's not going to be black. It's not going to be brown. It's not going to be anything else. This B represents blue, and the G here represents green. So the G for girls is G for green, abbreviated GRN, green, represents five. B for butt is B for blue, abbreviated BLU for the color blue, represents six. V for violet, V for VIO, and this is what I'm using for the abbreviation for seven. And you can see on the color code chart, it is nice violet. G represents gray, and gray and white are shades that are very close to each other on the other end of the extreme. So on one side, we start with black and brown, and on the other side, we end up with gray and white for the last two numerals of eight and nine. So G for gray, G-R-Y, represents eight. W for white, W-H-T, represents nine. So you have zero through nine represented by bad boys race our young girls, but Violet generally wins. And then good sir. The G for good sir, the G for gold, GLD, is plus or minus 5%. S for sir, for silver, abbreviated S-I-L, for plus or minus 10%. And if we happen to have a no band, that's plus or minus 20%. The resistors in your kit are not four band resistors. They are not what we what we have in the majority of our lab as plus or minus five percent resistors. You happen to have and you happen to be blessed with precision resistors, which are five band resistors. And we'll talk about those in a moment. Let's stay with four band for a moment. So in the four band decoding, what's the first band represent? First band represents first digit. Second I band represents. Is, is, um, is, it, is, is it creeping on us again? A little bit, yeah. Uh, let's take a look here. I'm not getting a. Uh, let's change the mic. Because I can use three different mics here. Is this mic any better? Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Yep, seems yeah. better. Okay. better. All right, yeah. Let me know at any point in time if you can't hear them that we're not communicating as the way I need. So as we take a look at this exercise on the screen, uh, we happen to have, and let me widen this just a tad to here and take the magnification down just a touch to here and to here. Okay, so let's do this together. A four band resistor is coded this way and you read this from left to right. And on a four band resistor, that last band will either be silver or gold or no band. So you look for silver or gold, it'll never appear in the first band. So that way you know which order you're reading the color bands. And I specify the order on my worksheets from left to right. So the first band is red. Red represents what numeral? A two. So your first digit is a two. So you write down a two. Two. Then the second band represents the second digit. The second digit is brown. What is the value of the second digit? It's a one. So what I'm going to do here is I'm now going to enter a one. So now do I have a two and a one so far? 
The third band does not represent a third digit on these four band resistors. The third band will be something called multiplier. And multiplier tells you what power of 10. And right here, the power of 10 will be 10 to the power of one. So what's 10 to the power of one? A 10. So what is 21 times 10? 21 times 10 is going to be equal to 210. Is that correct? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Another way to decipher this, another way to decipher this, and this is the way a lot of my students do this, instead of thinking about this third band as a multiplier with all of these powers of 10, I just simply tell them, put down the number of zeros. So it's 21 followed by how many zeros? Brown is how many zeros? One zero. Don't I have 21 over here followed by a singular zero over here? Which gives me 210. Silver is what degree of tolerance? Silver is the margin of error, if you will. Silver says plus or minus 10%. So I'm going to come over here and write down do, 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 do. my plus or minus 10%. And since I have percent at the end, all I have to do is this. Did that finish my first row? Did we do that together? Let's do another one, just so that you can feel good about this. All right, take a look at the second one. And let's do this together. First band is the first digit. What is my first digit, my friends? Somebody call it out. 43. Well, it's a four for the first digit. The second band is an orange, and you're correct. Orange represents the value of three. So my second digit is going to be a three. So I start off with a 43. And then my third band is my number of zeros, yes? Red represents how many zeros? Two. Two zeros. Boom, boom. That's 4,300. Or what you ought to do, what you're going to be learning to do is this. You're going to be learning your engineering notation. And ideally, ideally, we would code this as 4.3 kilo ohms. Okay. And if you put, if you use your, your marvelous, marvelous scientific calculator, that we acquired, and we do this. I'm going to go off this share for just a moment, and I'm going to come to L calculator and focus on said calculator. Cool. Turn on said calculator. This is our less than $9 calculator, by the way. It's a marvelous calculator for the money. And if you don't have this particular one that I suggested, you have something similar, that's fine. But if you code in four, three, zero, zero, that's what we interpreted the code for this, uh, this, uh, this resistance to be 4,300, yes? This calculator will automatically put this into the correct engineering notation if you hit this magic ENG key. Everybody see my ENG key? Watch what happens when I tap it. When I tap it, Oh, I have to hit enter first, silly me. And then I tap it. And then what do I end up with? I end up with 4.3 with a power of three. And we will learn that the power, 10 power of three represents kilo. Okay. So your calculator automatically converts everything into proper engineering notation for us. So for the time being, until we practice more about generic notation, you can go ahead and key in the decimal value. For those of you who wanna jump ahead with this engineering notation thing, I'm gonna skip this and just leave this for week two. Um, but go ahead and key in the decimal right there. And then this is also plus or minus what percent if it's silver, my friends? 10%. How about the third one? Let's do one more. 
somebody give me the first digit, the first two digits. Seven. A seven is the first digit. Second digit is a? Zero. Second zero. digit is a zero. Okay, when it's in this position, that is a digit. The digit is zero. What does my third digit represent? Number of zeros. How many zeros am I going to write on the end of this based on orange? Three, three. One, two, three. So how many ohms is that? That's 70,000 ohms, yes? Or if you want to do this, and let's go ahead and do this on the calculator. Um, do seven, zero, 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 and hit enter. And I get some scientific thing, 70,000. If I hit my engineering key, does it go to 70 with a 10 power of three? And wouldn't this be written in as 70 kilo? If I go to back to share my screen. So are we good with these examples here? 210, 4,300, 70,000. And then I've also written in the proper engineering notation. So from week two on, Everybody will be writing things down in proper engineering notation for this week. Just go ahead and write out all the, the numbers of zeros. Are we good with the first three exercises on this sheet? Let's talk about precision resistors. Precision resistors are what you have in your kits, my friends. And precision resistors, we happen to have all of them ending with a brown band. If they end with a brown band, take a look at brown on our chart. Take a look at tolerance. Tolerance for brown is plus or minus how many percent? One. One percent. These are rocking, these are rocking resistors in terms of accuracy. Not plus or minus five, not plus or minus 10. All of these are one percent based on all of these being brown bands. Let's take a look at how we decipher five band resistors. So here you do have first band, first digit, second band, second digit, third band, third digit, fourth band, number of zeros. So I repeat, first band, first digit, second band, second digit, third band, third digit, not, not number of zeros like we had up above, but third digit, and then the fourth band would be our number of zeros. So how would we decipher this particular guy? What would be my first digit? Brown is a what? One. One. My second band is my second digit. Black, according to my chart up here, black, and according to over here, represents what numeral am I going to type in for my second digit? Zero. 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 My third band, third band, is also black. It represents my third digit. What is my third digit that I'm going to type in? Zero. Another zero. My fourth band is my exponent multiplier, 10 power of two, or you can just simply say, add this number of zeros. Red is how many more zeros I have to add to this? Two. Two more zeros. Two. Zero, zero. So this gives me a what? A 10,000 or 10 kilo ohm resistor, plus or minus 1%. Are you good with that interpretation? Yes. Let's Let's jump down. Let's jump down. Let's jump down to let's jump down to um, number ten. Let's look at number ten together. I have a yellow, violet, green, orange, and brown. This is a five-band resistor, which means my first three bands are three digits. What is my first digit being yellow? My first digit is going to be what value? Four. Four. Good. My second band is violet. Violet represents what numerical value for second digit? Three. 
Seven. Seven. Very good. My third band is green. It's my third digit. What value should my third digit be if it's green? Five. 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 My fourth band is my exponent multiplier, 10 power of three, or the other way of saying it is my number of zeros. Orange represents how many zeros am I going to tag on the end of these numbers? Three. One, two, three. So do I have this properly coded as 470,000 ohms or 470 kilo ohms? Are we okay with that? And again, if you're not quite comfortable with putting in kilos yet, don't worry about it. We'll talk about that in greater detail this week. Just go ahead and code these this way. Any is questions about- Is it 475 or 470? Sorry? Is it I'm 475 sorry. or 470? I'm sorry, yes, yeah. There's my dyslexia creeping up on me. I say one thing, but I type another thing. Yeah, Don't we need it's an extra zero? Kilos. I'm sorry? Don't we need an extra zero because there's a brown at the end? No, Brown, that last, that last one, what's it say? On a five band, the last one is tolerance. Tolerance, Brown, means what percent? Plus oh, or minus one percent. Yeah, that last band is, is only for tolerance on a okay. five band resistor, okay? Good question. I'm glad you asked that. Some people might have missed that and put a one at the end. No, we don't put a one at the end. It's plus or minus one percent. Are we good with these samples that we've done so far? Are we good with this? Okay. Because uh, we've done the effort. I'm just going to go ahead and save this guy. Huh. Uh, next, the other handout was, okay, so we had this exercise to do. So we talked about this. We looked at this picture. Okay, we looked at this particular guy. We had one more word file. Uh, one more word file, multimeter fill in. This guy, uh, that's breadboard. I need my multimeter fill in. Here, multimeter fill in. Cool. So when you go through your multimeter tutorial, you will be able to answer these questions on this fill in sheet. All right, so you have to go through the multimeter tutorial. So do that. Now let's get back to Canvas and see if there's anything else lurking. So we're done with this particular page in Canvas. All right, now the best way, what we ought to do in Canvas that's really important for all of us to do is I'm gonna get out of this, uh, let's see, is there anything else here to cover? I think we got everything of substance. Oh yeah, discussions and discussion reply. This is important, this is a quick five and a quick 10 points. A number of classmates have already started this. So if I click on discussions, and it's, it's found over here on this side, you have modules, announcements, discussions. So if I click on discussions right here, it opens up our discussion board. And the discussion board is our official Canvas chat room. And in our official Canvas chat room, if you go to click on week one, first assignment, click this. Introductions, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to introduce yourself to the class. You state what it is you want to learn in this course while you're taking the course. Have you taken other online courses before? But the most interesting one that, that, that uh, most of you will connect with each other on is which interests or hobbies might you want to share with each other on the class? So you post your, you do your post by clicking on the reply button here. So when you click on the reply button, it opens up a dialog box. And in this dialog box, I might type down, hi, I'm the co-guy and I like ham, oops, here. I can't type with all this stuff on my board, on my desk, sorry. Ham, 
This is horrible. Ham. Radios. Okay. There you go. And then once you type whatever answers, you, you, you introduce yourself. Hi, I am so-and-so. And do you use your first name and last name? Uh, what do you want to learn in this course? Uh, have you taken online classes before? What hobbies? And I just put down my hobbies. You have to hit this blue button that says post reply. If you don't post your reply, no one will see it. So now it's posted. And as it's posted, it's posted as test student. And it's, it's, it's not indented. So everybody's posting is, if you look at this, is on the far left-hand margin of each of these boxes. So your postings will be very easy for me to see. So you have to do a post. Now, after you do the post, then what you need to do right here is you're going to reply to at least one other student. You're going to find a student that uh, post a previous post that has not been responded to yet, if you can. Then you want to compare ideas, agree, disagree in a friendly way, support each other, uh, especially about your hobbies. And then you hit the, 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 the submit button. So here's an example, Harpreet. If I can use you as an example, Harpreet says, hi, everybody. My name is Harpreet. He works uh, for city and county San Francisco, stationary engineer, and then uh, has done 12, 12 and 24 volt systems. In the PLC class, we will play with 24 volt um, systems and more. Uh, likes to troubleshoot, first online class, hobbies, pretty much anything working on hands, cars, motorcycles, heavy equipment. So he did a nice posting. Here, Javier did a reply to his post. And you can see this is a reply because it's indented and it's underneath Harpreet. So he's replying to Harpreet. What does, what is the job of a stationary engineer? And then it goes on for the Chandler did a posting because his information's on the far left-hand column and he's a dad. Yay. Go dad. Father's day's coming up. I hope everybody uh, remembers you with big hearts. And then Andrew did a reply to Chandler. We can tell it's a reply because it's indented. And he wrote down Chandler. I found your post particularly interesting. And it goes on from there. So, and then Chandler then replied back to Ch uh, uh, Andrew because that's indented further. So here is where you officially, <coughs> officially, and for a grade, type in your discussions for the first week of introductions and reply to introductions for you and classmates. And that's worth between five and 10 points. That is an assignment that must be done. Okay, any questions about that part of Canvas, my friends? Grades, if you click on grades, you will see your individual grades. I've marked in grades so far. When you finish something and you upload something, my friends, listen carefully. Are you listening carefully? Very quick. Grade does automatically appear. I generally do my grading on Monday nights because that's when everything is due on Monday or, or, or uh, Sunday nights. Monday nights is because everything is due on Sunday nights generally. And so when you, when you submit something, don't send me an email on Saturday saying, well, I uploaded such and such. How come I don't see a grade yet? Well, A, there's one of me. Uh, B, there's like almost 30 of you. And we have a number of assignments for people to turn in. So you multiply that, let's say 25, 25 times like nine things I'm looking for from you or eight things I'm looking for, for from you, several hundred things I'm going to be looking at. I will, my job to look at it and I will look at it, uh, but it doesn't happen automatically. So as soon as you upload something, don't expect a grade immediately. Um, I will definitely endeavor to to try to get those grades in done by sometime Monday, or certainly before we meet on Tuesday night. And if I happen to miss anything, then our break time is when you raise your hand and say, hey, co-guy, you happen to have maybe perhaps miss something. I will look at it. And on a silent screen, I will make whatever adjustments are necessary. So that's what happens with respect to grades, discussions we no noted. And um, one last thing, and I have to get out of the student view. leave student view 
in a moment. It will cycle through and leave student view. Right here, underneath this symbol on the far left-hand side, you see account. When you click on account, you see your name. When you see your name, go to settings. And in settings, it's really important right now that you make sure you have your personal email address in addition to your zone mail. Your personal email address should be the one that pings your cell phone. If you don't see your personal email address here, if it wasn't instructed for you to do so by previous instructors, you want to click add email address and then you will type in that other email address, which is your personal email address, the one that will ping your phone, whatever that is, and then you click register email. So could everybody make sure to do that? It is in Canvas. Click your own account. You should see your name, go to settings. And if you don't see your personal email address up here already, click add email address and make sure it is added. Once that is done, then you want to go here, watch my screen, watch my screen. Uh, under notifications, here's where you're gonna see your preferences for notifications. You will see one column, maybe more than one column, depending upon how many emails you, how many email addresses you load up in here. But you wanna make sure that the green check boxes are checked for your personal email address due date has to have a green checkbox announcement has to have a checkbox this one does not have to have a green checkbox we can leave this here grading has to have a green checkbox invitation does not have to have a green checkbox uh late grading submission comment uh these guys can be whenever you log in okay so these can be in the middle Discussions, these can be in the middle. Uh, but the most important things are due date, announcement, and grading. Very, very important to see those uh, because when I send out announcements and I ping the whole class, you will see it ring you through uh, Canvas to your personal email. And how often should you be checking? Where do you check email? Right here. So all we need to do here is to make sure due date is green check, announcement is green check, grading is green check. That's the most important thing for now. On the far left-hand margin, inbox, if I click on this, this is where you actually send and receive your emails. So I will do this. I'm going to send to our course right here, summer. And I'm going to send to the entire class, students, all students. And I will type in uh, E50 testing. Uh, spell it right, Co. Spell it right, Co. Testing. And each one gets an individual message. And I'm doing testing testing and then i'm going to hit send now if you had set up your personal email or if your zone mail pings your cell phone then your cell phones would have been pinged by now what you do is reply with your first and last name and i will see it over here so our emails from this point forward should come through Canvas, through this box, and you generate an email very simply by clicking this. And what you're generally going to do is you're going to find our class, very few classes that you're enrolled in the summer, uh, and uh, we'll be here select this and then who you're going to find teacher is generally you communicate to me and there's my given name so you know francis co is there 
and then your name. And then type in whatever your message is here and then you hit send. Send, okay, required field. I'll just do something here and hit send. Message is sent. And as the message is sent, what will happen at the very, very top of my screen is the inbox should show a little blue circle. It should show a one. And that should show me that I have a message received. So we'll talk more about this this next week. But if you can get your email, your personal email set up in your profile under settings, under settings, add it in here as something that will ping your phone, then uh, that will be great. Any messages and announcements I send through here, you will be able to see. All right, we covered a lot of ground, my friends. Are there any questions that any of you have before we part company this evening? Yeah, I'm having trouble locked into the, the school email. Okay, I will help you with that offline. Is there anybody else that has any other questions? When's our next meeting? Our next meeting will be next Tuesday at six o'clock. So same time, same place. Uh, you will see a Zoom reminder. So keep an eye out in Canvas for these modules because they will show you specifically what is assigned for you to do. You have the Khan Academy set up, Khan assignments, breadboard tutorial, fill in, multimeter tutorial, fill in, start color coding. We filled in a third of it already. Ohm's Law Practice, we did a couple of those already. Um, the most fun part I think that you'll have is building those circuits. <laughs> That's the most fun for me anyway. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, definitely get going on that. Uh, so, so your assignments are, are all shown here and generally everything is due uh, by uh, Sunday midnight. The only thing that's due by Monday midnight, I believe, are your photo uploads give you an extra day there. I will stay behind for anybody who has any questions. Uh, I will stay behind. I will turn off the recording. And I, as soon as I get the Zoom, I will, um, as soon as I get the Zoom, I will um, process it and then upload it to YouTube and go from there. So with that, if you could all go back to, let me go back to my camera because I need to take a quick picture of everybody and your smiling faces and uh, close my chat. There we go. The Dean wants this part. So turn back on your webcams and cool. Let's do this. Lean in. I'm going to zoom in like so. And one, two, okay, everybody visible. All right, lean in so I can see your faces. One, two, and smile, peace. Loving you guys. Yay, I love that. Yeah, cross-eyed is so fun. I love it. Yay, fantastic. All right, with that, have a lovely week. I will stay behind and leave uh, this Zoom open for any questions. Uh, otherwise, keep an eye out for your Canvas emails. Check emails every day, daily. Uh, check your uh, um, Discord for things that will come through, but my official stuff will come through Canvas. And uh, with that, have a great evening. Take care. Adios. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Looking forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you.